Окупанти до нас в Україну, форма новенька воєнні машини, так трохи поплавився їх інвентар. Байрактар. Байрактар. Російські танкісти сховали з кущі, щоб лавтим посьорбати до паніщі, та трохи у чах перегрівся на бар. Байрактар. Великая страна. Кто воды всякое устроение, разные потужные ракеты, машины залезни у нас на все доводы есть комментар. Байрактар Байрактар Вони захопити хотіли на зразу А ми зачаїли на орків образу З російських бандитів робить примар Байрактар Байрактар 
Міська поліція, справи заводить Там пивцю рашистів ніяк не знаходить Хто винен, що в нашому полі глухар Байрактар Байрактар Веде пропаганду кремлівський урод Слова пропаганди ковтає народ Тепер нове слово знає цар Байрактар 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 I'm the Enforcer, and I'm accompanied by Enforcer Matt. And good evening, folks. It's Enforcer Matt, and welcome back to day 763 of the news. And it's good to see you all once again. Why Belgrad is under a massive attack tonight, and Ukraine is slamming them hard. And it's good to see you all once again. And of course, we're going to be covering the past 24 hours of the news of the war in Ukraine as NATO forces are forward deploying into the area of the Suwalki Gap as of right now. And we're also seeing that massive barrages have begun on Russian territory again, conducted by the Free Russian Army as they continue continue to possibly advance closer to the city of Belgorod in the capture of one of the largest cities that is along the Ukrainian-Russian border. The news tonight is absolutely massive, and not only that, we have been getting some very interesting and shocking news pretty briefly and very quickly 
before we were running this news tonight about what appears to be a developing situation inside of the Baltic region as diplomatic relations in between the Russians and the Baltic states along with the Belarusians have completely deteriorated and it appears that Baltic countries are expulsing um, Russian diplomats and not only that, German armed forces and other forces appear to be deployed into the area of Swolki Gap in far larger numbers just over the course of the day. We also have heard some very large things coming out of the Russian Federation as well as another attack very similar to the crocus hall attack although very smaller uh, very much small very much so smaller in scale has occurred in st petersburg and we have also heard about a, an apparent official statement by the u.s department of state on their position on ukrainian deep strikes which we'll also be talking about tonight not only that, we've gotten a very concerning statement from the Deputy uh, Minister of Defense of the United Kingdom about British battle readiness if a full-on conventional war was to begin very soon. And not only that, we got an endless volume of frontline information coming out of Ukraine showing that there is some kind of movement being made on some frontline areas today. It is a lot of news to cover. It's an unbelievably high amount. And we're going to be making sure to guide you all through it from the most breaking bits of news to uh, the, of course, major news of the day that is still going on on the battlefields. But... Moving on from that and into the area of the Suwalki Gap, many heard yesterday the threats that were made by President Lukashenko, or Lukashenko, whichever. And Enforcer, I, and Enforcer, I, we, we went through just through a huge amount of lag just then. I think we're having to catch up. Yeah, I think we're having to catch up here. So stand by, everyone. Hate to hear it. Uh, appears like we just went under a little bit of a lag attack. The internet was fine on my end, though. I like I quickly threw off like to the loading screen and checked Discord, and it looks like everything was fine. But nevertheless, we are going to be continuing on with the news, and hopefully nothing much was missed. What was the last thing you heard me say, Matthew? I heard something about the Sowalki Gap, and then I heard... <laughs> okay, so, uh, of course, that was Mr. Corky getting into the studio. But beyond that... What the Belarusians and Russians were saying the other day is that they were planning on closing the Sawolki Gap in between the Kaliningrad Oblast and Belarus by pretty much invading the area and completely cutting off the Baltic states, a part of the NATO alliance, from the rest of NATO and further resupply, possibly cutting them off and leading to them being completely encircled and really without much hope of a defense. This was immediately countered by the Latvian government by expelling the Russian diplomats that were inside of Latvia just today. According to Azov South, the Latvian foreign ministry declared the Russian diplomat persona non grata and ordered him to leave the country by April 10th, thus meaning that the diplomatic envoy of the Russian Federation of Latvia has now been expelled from the country and is going to be nowhere to be seen, pretty much meaning that the Latvians have cut off all diplomatic ties with the Russian Federation. Not only that, but in the area of the Sawalki Gap, very close nearby, in the town of Medinika, Medininka, which is just two kilometers away from the Belarusian um, and Lithuanian border, we saw the deployment, or more so the forward deployment, of some NATO forces in this clip right here. This appears to be entirely um, forces of the German here, uh, spelled H-E-E-R, which are a part of the German Bundeswehr, which is the German Armed Forces. It appears that they're moving quickly into the area, it looks like it's actually a part of a bolstering effort to try and at least increase the overall amount of personnel within the area. We can see here some Unimogs. We can also see some Lukes. Uh, the Lukes is a kind of German wheeled uh, transport vehicle, very similar to that of the Stryker armor personnel carrier, which is a wheeled armor personnel carrier of the U.S. Army. We can see a load of these as well. This is suggesting that the unit that may be moved into the area is something along the lines of a mechanized unit of the German army. We're not exactly sure the exact size. Uh, it may be a brigade sized unit or it may actually be a little bit smaller than that. Maybe a regiment sized unit. Well, you see more support vehicles, more Unimogs. But it does appear that this one train right here is showing that there is a larger German unit of the German army moving into the area around this border town. This is only two kilometers away from what we were able to find from the Lithuanian-Belarusian border and is quite close to the Sawalki Gap area. To show you all where this is, Medininka is right up here and the Sawalki Gap is just about 
80 miles away. This is actually fairly close to the Suwoki Gap as far as we've seen forces being deployed. From what, we, uh, from what we understand, we see very little NATO forces actually being deployed in the area of the Suwalki Gap. It's more so seeming to be a deployment around the fringes of where the Suwalki ga Gap would be created, as there may be some kind of a plan to allow Russian forces to rapidly advance, therefore causing some large supply line issues, and then a NATO force would come in and pretty much encircle the punch, uh, or more so the blitz that the Russians and Belarusians would create, and try and cut them off from any supplies and destroy them, pretty much trapping them inside of the Suwalki Gap. That's at least what I would be assuming NATO's strategy is, because once again, we don't really see a lot of NATO forces that are actually in the Suwalki Gap area. They're more so outside of it, inside of Poland, here near the area of Bielestok, I believe is how that's pronounced, or up here near the area of Vilnius either in those two directions, still about 60 miles away on both sides, but not that far away in reality as far as armed forces move. But it is showing that the tensions in the Baltic states are certainly rising and that behind the scenes there has been a quiet statement um, that the Baltics need to be further reinforced just in case if there is some kind of a real full-scale Russian-Belarusian plan to actually try and conduct a conventional war inside of, of, of Eastern Europe. From what we understand, crazy to me that if they're actually moving the stuff there to the uh, Belarusian border because of those statements made by Lukashenko, it's like, hey, did we really take him that seriously? It's like, there must be something else that they're that they're hearing rather than that because he was just yapping yesterday. Like, even we saw that. And I would agree. I would, I would say yes, we certainly did see that. But another thing that was interesting is that yesterday it did appear that it showed the force locations of Belarusian armed forces. To quickly go back to this clip and show this on the PowerPoint. Let's see here. That is not the one we're looking for. We're actually looking for another one. That was, and let me make sure that I have this correct. Let's see here. Where in the world did it go? Um, are you kidding me? The marker is gone? Um, so the marker appears to actually be gone. I don't know why and I don't know how. But beyond that, to quickly recap what we saw the other day, we saw that Lukashenko made a statement saying that the Russians and the Belarusians were going to attempt to close the Suwalki Gap, and on the PowerPoint board, it actually showed some Belarusian forces that appear to have been deployed in the Grodno City area. Uh, they look to be maybe a brigade-sized or maybe even working towards a division-sized unit, so going off of that, this may be something that NATO is seriously considering might actually happen, considering that Belarusian force deployments, maybe on satellite picture and also based off of what we're seeing from official Belarusian statements, appear to be showing that they may be trying to work towards creating an encirclement or an envelopment of the Suwalki Gap region. But moving on... From also, Enforcer, if you want to reference that uh, video you were talking about, you can go to our likes tab on our Twitter page, and it's uh, at the top. You know what, Matthew? I just realized now that you said that, it hit me. I didn't include it on the map ever. I went straight to our Twitter to show that, to go and plug the Twitter. That's why I wasn't able to find it. So let me really quickly scroll down and show you all that clip. Because I was, I was thinking, I swore we had it easy to access yesterday, and we do. So here it is. I'm going to drag this over here. This is from Visegrad24, and I'll show you all the little map that we see on the PowerPoint. Let's see here. It is right here. And this map, although you can't see it too well, it's actually showing the northern Belarusian area right about here where these units are. And Grodno is about right there. So these Belarusian units that appear to be depicted on the map are actually pretty much on the Lithuanian and Polish borders somewhere. Uh, I would assume that one of these units is based around Goja and the other one is based around Ratichi. You can see that on the map right there because Grodno you can kind of see it right there on the map it's labeled right there Grodno and these these little units are very close to the Polish Lithuanian border and in what would appear to be almost a marching order or a striking position where they could start to advance towards the Suwalki Gap area. There is a bit of a problem with this though, planning wise, because the the Belarusians really cannot just advance through the Suwalki Gap um, from the southeast to the northwest, like we would imagine, because a lot of the roads in the area do not go in that direction. A lot of the roads in the area go from south to north and north to south. There are very few roads that actually make their way pretty much directly across the Suwalki Gap. The ones that do are quite small. We believe that most of them are not paved. And not only that, there is a very sizable forest here that pretty much cuts off any kind of armored warfare 
that could really be conducted by the Belarusians. The Russians, on the other hand, may actually have an easier go of it if they were to try and conduct an invasion. There is a strip of forest here in the southeastern part of the Kaliningrad Oblast, but beyond that, there isn't really a lot of forest in the rest of Poland. And not only that, the uh, interstate or, mo or motorway 65 pretty much leads directly to the rear lines of Sawolki and would most likely encircle any NATO forces that were within, side of, were within the town. That's most likely why we're seeing that NATO forces are being deployed farther away inside of other towns such as near the area of Medininka or further down towards Bielestok so that way they would not be enveloped in this rapid encirclement that could be conducted by surprise by Russian and Belarusian forces uh, but beyond that it is something of a concern and I gotta say this Mr. Lunchtime guy still cracks me up as of right now. Like, that, that is just a funny look. But beyond that, it is time for us to move on and into the rest of the news outside of the Baltics. Because there was actually a good amount that went on today that did concern NATO, or at least concern countries that were a part of NATO. Probably one of the most concerning ones is that the British uh, Deputy uh, Defense Minister came out with a very shocking statement today. And this was one that really kind of caught me a little off guard, although we have heard this said a little bit before. It's always been by amateur military analysts, and it's not been by the British Department, uh, well, British Ministry of Defense itself, but we got a statement today out of London from the Deputy Defense Minister saying that if Britain was to get involved in some kind of a larger battle with the Russian Federation or was to get involved in a major land war in Europe, the British military would not be able to fight for any longer than two months, according to the Deputy Chief of defense staff lieutenant general uh well actually deputy chief of defense staff lieutenant general sir rob mcgowan that was according to his direct claim today and that is actually a statement by a minister of the british government showing that apparently there is very little faith that the British Army would be able to hold out all that long against Russian forces. That is not due to a lack of training. That is not due to poor equipment. That is merely a matter of funding and a matter of available munitions that the British have at their disposal. According to what we know from what the uh, Deputy Minister of Defense said today, Apparently, the United Kingdom has been severely undercutting, uh, undercutting the military spending budget of the United Kingdom and has been prioritizing new weapon procurements programs over the stockpiling of munitions. This has left the British military as a whole, the Royal Navy, the British Army, the Royal Air Force, and the Royal Marines, pretty much completely deficient of any large ammunition stores to be able to at least remain within a prolonged conflict during the initial stages of a war where a war economy could then be mobilized. Apparently, the British would only be able to last around two months before they would completely run dry of most major munitions. This is something that NATO largely accounts for, uh, as the alliance can distribute munitions from one country to the next, and all, um, well most there's an exception in the british uh instance but most countries can use pretty much any ammunition from any other country for example us 155 millimeter howitzer shells can be used in british 155 millimeter artillery pieces that is the reason why nato is such an amazing alliance is that most calibers are standardized Pretty much all rifles within NATO currently fire a 556 by 45 millimeter cartridge. Not only that, most heavy artillery pieces fire a 155 millimeter round. Light artillery pieces fire a 105 millimeter round. And beyond that, the mortars come, I believe, in 60 millimeter and 81 millimeter, as well as 120 millimeter. Those are your three different categories of mortars. And everything. Man, has been... I want I want NATO to standardize that 50 cal round. Can they do that? I think they have actually. I think the 50 BMG is a standardized Ooh. round. So. Uh, most countries. Man, I'm glad to hear it. Oh yeah, most countries don't even use uh, anything rather than the M2 50 caliber machine gun or some variant of that M2 or the Barrett M82 uh, anti-material rifle. So it's pretty much a standardized weapon across the board, anything that uses 50 BMG. But that is still quite concerning to hear that the British Deputy Defense Minister has come out and made such a concerning and grave statement today. And I hope that the British take this as a statement. Um, take this well as a statement and prepare their defense uh, industry properly as well as their military properly to deal with the situations that we're seeing coming up in the future. This isn't the 90s anymore and this isn't the 2000s. This is now 
the 2020s. The 2020s are a very turbulent time in history again. And I do not believe the country should be caught uh, lacking in this kind of an instance, not to literally say the modern phrase, but I do not believe that countries should be caught lacking in this modern day and age. I think that many European nations need to heed the warning that we're getting out of the Ukraine war and the diplomatic uh, murmurs that we're hearing in the Baltics and start to prepare their armed forces for what may be a, an, an inevitable land war in Europe. Hopefully that land war will never come. But if it was to ever come, every country in Europe, along with the United States, should be completely prepared to deal with this situation until they are able to mobilize a war economy. Many people also do not understand this, that a nation is not supposed to have a stockpile of munitions that can last for years. The most likely scenario is that starting off in a major conflict, your country will have enough heavy munitions and really munitions of all categories to last approximately four to six months. And that's because you don't want to have enough munitions built up that you, it could last for years, because that is a massive drag on economic output because you're putting so much effort and so much cost into building ammo supply yards. And not only that, after time, a lot of these shells begin to degrade in quality. Either the propellants become poor or the explosives become faulty, and you have to start replacing them. So really, realistically, you would want four to six months of munitions that you could work off of. Beyond that, in that four to six month time where there's the outbreak of a major conflict, your country should be working on mobilizing a war economy, meaning that most likely rationing would begin for the public on consumer goods, and a lot of materials that would have been used to make consumer goods in the past will be completely diverted into war efforts or war production of the production of munitions, weapons, vehicles, and such things like that that will be able to keep the armed forces running. Wars are an incredibly all-consuming kind of a deal. It is the most consumptive form of activity that humans are able to undertake. Wars consume more materials than literally anything else. Just normal civilian consumption, consumerism as it's called in America, doesn't even touch the sheer volume, the sheer scale that a military can consume when it's engaged in a full-on conventional war. Uh, so you can't really practically expect for munitions to survive longer than four to six months, no matter how much you stockpile them. Uh, and also, it would be impractical to stockpile more than four to six months. To explain a little bit about this and why this is the case, historically, in World War I, nearer to the end of 1914, really every side by that point had run out of, um, of large caliber artillery shells, and the front line started to get a little bit more quiet during that time. That's when the Christmas Truce of 1914 happened, because the front lines pretty much became stagnant and largely quiet as both sides were racing to, uh, to really kick off their war industry and to start producing the shells that they would need for later offensives that would come from the years down the line. But that is something that happened back then in World War I, and that was with some of the largest alliances that the world had ever seen up to that point that had been stockpiling munitions for this inevitable war that was really going to happen, and everyone had known about it really since the end of the Franco-Prussian War. Then in World War II, there was also a couple of times where some sides just ran out of munitions. Although that was a little rare once the United States joined, because the United States was such an industrial power at the time that once it joined and began the Lend-Lease, really no one on the side of the Allies ever ran out of munitions. And the Germans, uh, through very interesting means, such as slave labor and other forms, were able to keep war production up fairly high, really just due to the complete disregard of human life. But beyond that, uh, that is something to keep in mind as far as uh, war mobilization goes. They don't have to last forever. They just have to last four to six months. And the British military and the British government need to be working as hard as possible to make that a reality here in the shortest time available, as it does appear that things are getting quite tense. But moving on from that, we have to talk about what is going on with Lukashenko because there is a lot that has happened today. A lot that people are saying today on what Lukashenko did. We're seeing armed forces moving into the area near the Swolki Gap almost in a direct response to what Lukashenko said. It's literally 24 hours later, NATO forces are moving into the area and we're seeing that the British government is now talking about the British military's combat readiness status almost like everyone is taking this statement by Lukashenko very seriously. And a lot of y'all appear to have weighed in on that, whether y'all believe NATO actually took those statements seriously or not. It's not really a question of whether we take it seriously or not. It's really a question of whether the powers that be in NATO took that statement to be a serious threat or a credible threat or not. And Matthew, what do you think about that threat? Do you think it was serious or not?
All right. So we asked everyone in the audience, what are your thoughts about NATO moving uh, large amounts of equipment to uh, Lithuania's border with Belarus as of today? And it looks like 48% said that NATO took Lukashenko seriously yesterday. 29% said NATO is getting ready for a Russian invasion. And 13% said it's just normal movements. And me personally, I could have thought that uh, Lukashenko was just yapping yesterday. It sounded like maybe he was like halfway drunk or out of it and was simply running his mouth. But apparently NATO took it seriously because with them moving all of this equipment right to the border with Belarus, they're sending a strong message that even the jokes or the drunken statements are going to be taken with the utmost seriousness. And we're going to respond to it in the most severe way possible. So now uh, either that or NATO has maybe received some sort of information that maybe Belarus is going to work with Russia to perhaps cause a provocation right there on the border with Lithuania. And that could be another reason as well. I would tend to believe it's the first option I mentioned, but you really never know because we don't have enough information as of yet. But certainly a big escalation, and it looks like 48% of you believe that NATO is taking that seriously. But Enforcer, what say you? I would have to say I believe that this is something that NATO took very seriously because with the British statements about what is going on as far as their combat readiness goes, once again, right after Lukashenko made that statement, also with the German forces moving into the area that we saw on film, and on top of that, the Latvians expelling Russian diplomats from Latvia and kicking them out by April 10th, this is all coming together, in my opinion, to show that the, the, that the NATO alliance took those statements very seriously, and there is a good reason why. The Sawalki Gap is an incredibly small area, and while I mentioned earlier that it'd be very hard for the Russians and the Belarusians to pretty much just march straight forward and just take Sawalki pretty much in a, uh, really just a head-on offensive because the roads, the road structures don't really work in this area, it is still an incredibly small area. It's only 40 miles wide, and when you put that into perspective, during some of those early days of the war in Ukraine, the Russians were moving nearly 20 miles per day in some directions. Even in one direction heading towards Kyiv, it was around 15 miles a day. So going off of that, we know that the, uh, that the Russians and the Belarusians, if they worked from both sides, could probably try and close this gap within 24 to 48 hours, maybe even 72 hours if we're really pushing it. And so this is a serious concern. If they were to do something like this and immediately close off this gap, if they were working as fast as they possibly can and nothing impeded them and for some reason NATO was completely taken by surprise, the entirety of the Baltic states would now be completely cut off from any kind of land supply route. And not only that, Russian forces would now have an open access into the Baltic Sea where they may be able to base anti-ship and anti-air defenses inside of Kaliningrad to try and further interdict any kind of supply efforts that would be occurring inside of the Baltic states. Not only that, to Sweden and Finland as well. This is a massive concern for NATO and especially the northeastern area of our alliance. And so it appears that we're trying to make the message that any kind of a statement, whether it be considered a joke by most or serious by some, is to be treated as though it is a dire threat against the NATO alliance and to show that any kind of a statement will be taken seriously and that a reaction can be expected if that kind of an offensive was planned. And so going off of that, I think that that is a fairly good response, in my opinion. Because considering the danger that is posed if the Sawalki Gap was closed and taken under the control of a Russian-led uh, alliance, this could pose a massive threat to NATO security. And not only that, to our future uh, conventional war that would occur within the area. And so going off of that, I hope I was able to address this bit of Western news, more so NATO news, fairly well. But it's time for us to move back into Russia, as it appears that today... Something happened in St. Petersburg. We don't really have a lot of information, but it appears that some kind of an attempted, uh, an attempted little, uh, I don't know what to call this, Matthew, a little hanky-panky was had out on the street, and a gun was pulled and shots were fired. Uh, so here's the clip. It's a cursed snuffle, uh, also known as a melee. Yes, that's, it is a melee. <laughs> I believe that's, that's the word we're looking for. But we can see folks running around. We can see this guy here, whip out the gat, and he starts busting cats. Oh, damn. Oh, he's shooting at the feet, too. Did you see that? He just almost shot his own foot. Look at that. Look, watch. Oh. Oh. Oh, oh they start man. beating him. Oh, look. They're mobbing that guy. What the hell is going on? Who's fighting who? I don't know. It's just absolute chaos. That broke up pretty quick. And now I don't even think they know who they were wait, actually wait, punching. Wait. Like yeah, who even was getting punched? The dude just got up and walked off like nothing happened. Hang on, so we're looking at Adidas Stripe guy here. Okay, so he gets... Wait a minute. What? What the hell's going on here? Wait a minute, hang on. So, 
Hold up, everyone. Hold up. If I'm seeing this right, Adidas Stripe Man runs over here. Okay, wait a minute. Hang on. We got to wait for it to zoom back out. So he runs over here. He gets in a fight with this guy. And so the, the, the guy who just started a gunfight in the middle of the street starts a fight with this guy. So everyone on the street comes running over and beats this guy's ass. Like, like with the gunman. I don't even know what's going on here. So, so Adidas Stripe Man is still back here. And... Man, it seems like it might be, like, gang-related or something, the way these guys are acting. Like, it seems, like, a little bit too weird. Like, they're acting... Like, when the fight broke up, they just sort of walked off. Like, nobody was really angry or anything. They're just kind of, like, uh, a little bit stirred up. I don't know what to make of this, honestly. Like, and they're all wearing Adidas traps or track suits. This is, like, Gopnik Central right here. Like, have you ever seen a stereotypical Gopnik? This is a Gopnik right here. I don't even know what the hell's going on here, but apparently there was some kind of a gunfight in the streets of St. Petersburg. We don't really know much more than that, uh, and it seems as though it may have been picked up by Russian media a little bit from what we heard, and it, it took off a little bit. So it looks like the Russians are trying to make this uh, out to be another kind of a Crocus City Hall event, although I honestly think this was just Gopnik Central going World Star, but, you know, that is what it is. Moving on from St. Petersburg and the chaos that uh, went down in the streets today, it's time for us to go on out towards Samara, because we were we were able to get a further clarification today about something that was brought up a while ago. And we were actually called um, fake news for putting it out. Uh, we put out a story a little while ago, and I believe that we have it in the United States of America. So let me travel over here across the world right here. We put out the statement uh, that was made by the, uh, I believe, the Financial Times saying that the United States had urged Ukraine to halt strikes on Russian oil refineries. This statement was considered by many to be absolutely fake and nothing more than clickbait for the most part. But we were able to further clarify today that the U.S. Department of, the, of State actually came out and made an official statement according to Nexta TV saying that the U.S. does not support uh, Ukrainian strikes outside its own territory. That is according to the State Department itself. And let me really quickly give you all the direct quote. Our position from the beginning of the war has always been that we do not encourage or support Ukraine striking outside of its own territory. This has been clearly communicated to our Ukrainian partners. That is a direct quote from the spokesperson of the Department of State, Matthew Miller. Uh, so going off of that, it appears that the initial claim that the United States is urging Ukraine not to strike oil refineries is in fact true. And I know someone's about to say in the live chat, well, Enforcer, he in that in that direct quote, he didn't say that he directly told Ukraine not to strike at Russian oil refineries. Yeah, but listen, like the political world, no one ever says anything outright. That statement right there did not say that they told them not to strike the oil refineries, but what it got across is that the United States doesn't want them to strike oil refineries, and therefore they're quietly behind the scenes. They're not going to publicly say this, but they are quietly behind the scenes telling the Ukrainians that they should not be striking Russian oil refineries. The reason why, and I'll explain why is in the best, most clinical way I can, is that if the Russians start losing oil refineries, they have to buy the fuel from somewhere else if they buy the fuel from somewhere else it's going to be outside of russia and if they buy it from outside of russia the amount of refined fuels that is available on the world market to be imported or exported anywhere is actually a lot smaller than the raw crude oil that can be transported somewhere to then be further refined that means if the russians have to start buying the sheer amount that they're in a deficit of each and every day it's going to rapidly increase the price of refined fuel imports worldwide and this means that that might lead to increasing fuel prices here in the united states and the fear is uh, according to what we understand that these rising fuel prices may change the outcome of a domestic presidential election here within the United States' own borders. So, the United States is saying, because of the ongoing presidential election and how rising gas prices may affect that election, that Ukraine should not take any opportunity that it can in the middle of a war for its own survival to strike at Russian oil refineries, because that may end up hindering uh, a, a certain kind of a thing within a U.S. election. Uh, now, of course... I can't get into anything on U.S. politics. That is something that we do not do on this channel. But one thing I will say is that I'm very tired of seeing 
very clear interference of U.S. domestic affairs in U.S. foreign affairs. That is something that should not be happening. And now this is something I've seen everyone trying to do at this point in the war. And now this has become quite clear that everyone is doing it in different ways, telling Ukraine to do this or not do that or to support Ukraine and not support Ukraine and tie it into directly domestic affairs inside the United States. That is absolutely ridiculous. U.S. foreign affairs and U.S. domestic affairs simply just do not mix. They are two entirely different ballparks that we're playing in. And the domestic sphere should not be impacting our foreign sphere, and our foreign sphere should not be impacting our domestic sphere. If one ends up uh, affecting the other in, in some way, shape, or form, the, all you can chalk that up to is rather unfortunate. But you cannot sit there and say, oh yes, let me tell you this domestic thing uh, to something that is happening in a war in Ukraine on the other side of the world. Uh, that's something that I just don't really like all too much. Of course, we can't get into politics, but now, now I can say that because it's an equal critique because now both sides have done it in one way or another. And that's just ridiculous. Like the amount the, the, the stupidity of people to try and treat Domestic affairs in the United States, which are, you know, largely trivial factors in reality, is because there's something that we can deal with internally here in America, to then apply those to the international sphere where things are irreversible and the effects of whatever happens out there are huge forever is absolutely insane. I mean, it really is insane to me, and I cannot believe that that is an actual statement that was made today by the uh, spokesman of the Department of Defense, uh, actually the uh, Department of State, Matthew Miller. Th that's just crazy to me. But anyways, moving on from that outside the city of Samara and moving back into Ukraine, it's time for us to show something that is really interesting here because we've actually seen that the Ukrainian war industry is working. Like, you know, some people say that the... Let's see, what, what would we call it? The war industry in Ukraine is non-existent and that they are not able to produce any of their own weapons. And so they entirely rely on Western imports of weapons to be able to keep their armed forces running or to replenish any losses. That is untrue. That is markedly untrue. We've actually seen that the Ukrainians are continuing to produce modified or upgraded variants of main battle tanks of Soviet vintage. And we also see that they're working on building and producing their own brand new weapons in-house, such as the Bodana SPG. And let me see if I can type in the 2S22 Bodana, which is right here. And this is the SPG that I'm talking about. This is the Bodana. This is a Ukrainian version of the Caesar SPG or the Archer SPG, if you want to get really really uh, you know, fancy, if you want to call it that. Uh, it is nothing more than a truck with a massive artillery piece on the back. It's a 152 millimeter artillery piece, so you can pretty much recycle these off of really any kind of a Russian or Soviet uh, era SPG that you want to, and then equip it onto this truck, and it's able to travel around, easily operate, and its shoot and scoot is unbelievable. It's really kind of the new way that the artillery is going to operate in the modern world is instead of having towed artillery, you have these wheeled SPGs like this one that are able to operate a lot faster and a lot more efficiently with a much smaller crew, meaning that you can spread out your artillery force. Let's say there's 10,000 of them. Instead of 10,000 guys operating 2,500 artillery pieces, you now have 10,000 artillery guys operating 5,000 artillery pieces. And that means you have more artillery pieces on the field and you also have less crews operating each one. I gotta say that I think I like this truck uh, better for its like rugged look than I do that Volvo like dump truck that they use to like carry around the big gun. This looks uh, much more rugged and I think to me more practical. It looks cool. I mean, it looks really neat. Uh, but also, they have a brand new chassis that they're making for this thing because this one's actually a little dated. They have a new uh, actual like chassis and cab for this thing. And check it out. We actually saw them building these inside of one of the Ukrainian factories in the far west. That is the new cab that you're seeing right there in this picture. Oh, yeah, that's, I, I'll be honest with you, I kind of like the old version, but the new one's not bad looking. It, it looks uh, futuristic. It does look pretty futuristic. And it's interesting to see how these factories work, because you would think, you know, of course, being an industrial kind of minded person, that this would be something on an assembly line. And it looks like they have some sort of an assembly line going on, but it's not really streamlined. It looks more like an artisanal um, kind of a workshop sort of a setup where they just kind of produce them as they go. Uh, but still, we can see some of the new hoods being moved uh, by, by a roof crane right here into position over here, where it looks like they're going to start fitting them onto chassis. But beyond that, 
it is really neat to see them um, continuing to try and produce brand new SPGs. Let's just hope that they can end up producing enough shells. We also got a little bit of news about that today. I didn't include it in the stream, but I saw it off stream. I believe it was put out by the New York Times, and it was talking about the uh, Ukrainians' ability to produce their own ammunition. And it was largely 152 millimeter shells, which is what a Bodana would use. So it looks like the Ukrainians are starting to lean into this new age kind of artillery, which is a is a, which is a wheeled mobile artillery piece like this that isn't towed. Uh, and there's just so many, like, I cannot explain the advantages enough of a wheeled SPG like this versus a towed SPG like the M777. And while the M777 is absolutely incredible, do not get me wrong, the Bodana is, and the Caesar SPG are really incredible in what they do because they do the exact same thing, especially the Caesar. Uh, and let me go type up the Caesar SPG. And I know I spelled that wrong, um, but let me see if I can get that right here. So here it is, the self-propelled howitzer, the self-propelled gun, whatever you want to call it. But the Caesar SPG has a 155 millimeter main gun mounted to the rear of the of the truck. This means that the Caesar SPG has the exact same firepower as the M777. But instead of having to unhook this artillery piece from the back of a truck, spin it around, extend the arms, then elevate the gun, and then do all of that stuff in between, you know, firing it and having the entire crew to man it, and then packing it back up and leaving, all you have to do with the Caesar SPG is drive it into the general position, elevate the gun, and then, you know, adjust maybe a couple of degrees to the left or right, fire off a couple of rounds, and then stow the gun away again, lock it in place, and then drive off. It's a much shorter amount of time for setup and takedown of this artillery piece than it is for an M777, and that's what makes it just that much better. With speed being the priority in the modern battlefield, Art artillery pieces like these are invaluable. I mean, they're precious uh, uh, resources for an armed and force. Go ahead. And also, by the way, Enforcer, do you, you know where that shell is going to hit? Do you know where it's going? Where? It's going to hit the like button because we have over 10,000 people watching at the moment, by the Dang. way, which is a huge amount of people. Holy and if y'all would, smash that like button to smithereens to let YouTube know to put the news out there faster. Because that, that greatly helps the stream out. And also, a huge shout out to everyone watching this news tonight. Apparently, it's a lot of people. And welcome to the news. All right, merciless plug right there. But moving on from that, it is time for us to get on out of the SPG news and the war industry news, showing that the Ukrainians are continuing to produce their own equipment. And it's time for us to start moving on into the next major news segment, which is the Free Russian Army. We have not gotten a lot of news from the Free Russian Army directly. We actually only have two video and picture clips showing that the Free Russian Army uh, is operating in the Gryveron front. However, inside the city of Belgrade, it is a very different story. Russian citizens are filming a massive amount of videos showing, uh, once again, an endless artillery barrage that is happening on the city of Belgrade, and once again showing us that apparently the Free Russian Army has once again revved up and may be on the move. We'll be explaining uh, all of this as we show the clips, but moving on into one of our first clips in Belgrade, we got to see one of the first explosions of the night here in this clip. It appears that it might have been some kind of an ammunition cache, but it was a pretty impressive explosion. And we can see right there, it was a fairly large explosion. I'm assuming, based off of the way that the explosion occurred, this may not actually be an ammunition cache. It may be, instead, some kind of a surface-to-air missile system that was just hit by artillery fire and ended up exploding. Um, the reason why is because the explosion pattern is fairly similar to a solid rocket propellant that we would find inside of a surface-to-air missile exploding on a Buk M1 system or an S-300 S-400 system that was hit by a drone in Ukraine and would have its uh, silo breached and the solid rocket propellant would begin shooting out of the side of that breach in the silo. That looks very similar, so we're assuming that this may be an air defense system around Belgrade that was hit and destroyed by the Free Russian Army. Moving on from that and into our next bit of news, we can also see continued explosions over the city of Belgrade. We hear the air sirens going off as we can once again see the Russian air defense attempting to try and intercept free Russian army barrages, but failing for a large part as we see MLRS rockets hitting all over the city. That one hit on an apartment building.
But that's the end of the clip right there. And we can once again see that the Free Russian Army is beginning large rocket barrages, rocket artillery barrages of the city of Belgorod. The last time we saw large rocket artillery barrages occurring by the Free Russian Army, it was during their ongoing advance deeper into the Belgrade Oblast. And for this reason, we believe that heavy artillery presence or heavy artillery barrages uh, directly correlate to a movement of the Free Russian Army, most likely some attempt uh, at suppressing fire on Russian forces to cover the advance of the Free Russian Army as they start to move, move deeper into the Oblast, possibly suggesting that at this very moment, Free Russian Army forces are beginning to engage the Russian border guards and the Russian Army as they start to move closer and closer to the major city of Belgrade, with around 330,000 people living within it that still have not evacuated as of this moment. We can also hear more explosions and fire occurring in this clip right here. We can see what appears to be an MLRS hit uh, that exploded on top of a car and set off the uh, the uh, the fuel inside the vehicle. I don't know why I'm stuttering so much tonight. I think I had way too much caffeine, but that's the end of the clip. And moving on into our next one, we also got to see more continued explosions over the city of Belgorod. We see the air defense once again attempting to intercept the incoming uh, Free Russian Army fire. And that's the end of that clip. Moving on into our final clip of the explosions and barrages occurring inside of Belgorod, we were able to hear that apparently one of the explosions was near to the building of the Inter Interior Ministry Department of Belgorod. The Interior Ministry is the one that manages the Russian border guards in the region and is a sub-department of the Russian FSB, as the Department of the Interior falls directly under the Directorate of Internal Affairs, meaning that that is the FSB. That is, that's the technical term for the FSB inside of the Russian Federation. But we see a picture here looking down the street in um, Bletgorod. Uh, Bletgorod? Is that how it's spelled on the map? No, it's not. So it looks like this might be Bliatograd uh, or something like that. So I like how they are uh, throwing in some humor. But beyond that, we can see the street of Belgorod right here. We see some police apparently cordoning off some part of the street and also fire trucks near the area, possibly showing that the impact was very close and may have ended up wounding someone. But beyond that, Moving on out of that news, it's time for us to actually move on into the only clips and pictures that we got of the Free Russian Army today near the Gryveron front. We were able to see one showing that the Free Russians are still in Belgorod again, once again just pure confirmation, right here. Chad music plays as we see this little fella here with his AK sitting inside of this slightly destroyed building. You see them looking out the window and once again showing that they are still inside of the Kazinka Gryveron area. When you see the Russian Volunteer Corps showing a building on fire as they're running away from it now. And that's the end of the clip. But moving on from that and into our next one, we also got to see that the Free Russian Army is still holding their positions in the area in this clip, which is actually a duplicate. So we're going to be deleting that one because that is a duplicate. I don't know why in the world I didn't catch that, but as soon as I saw it, I was like, that is a duplicate. But beyond that, we are seeing that the Free Russian Army is still holding their positions and apparently beginning another heavy barrage of Belgorod, uh, most likely to start moving towards the city again. We don't know exactly if that is the case because, once again, uh, we don't have a lot of video or picture evidence coming out from the Free Russian Army or from the Russian citizenry giving us an idea of where anyone is or what they're actually doing inside the Oblast, but... If our assumption is correct, we will most likely find out within the next 24 to 48 hours as video and picture evidence will be in pouring out the Oblast, showing us increased military activity and not only that, changing front lines. But beyond that, we are starting to hear that, um, it, it, that the Russians do look like they're getting a little ready for a confrontation. Uh, that is something that we just continue to see on a day-to-day -day basis, not only inside of the Russian Federation, uh, here in this news with the Free Russian Army once again continuing heavy barrages of Belgrad, and once again showing that they are holding uh, positions inside of the Russian Federation, but we also see that with the statements from Lukashenko, the actions of the Baltic states in response to Russian actions, and not only that, 
from the Western world as a whole, it does appear that a provocation by the Russians is in the works at the moment. And if this provocation was to occur and a an, an action was to be taken by the Russians, a lot of people are talking about what would it be? What would be the action that the Russians would take next? Of course, things aren't going to go from zero to 100. You know, that would be pretty crazy if intercontinental ballistic missiles just are flying all of a sudden out of the blue. But just in case, if we didn't get there immediately, there are a lot of different things that Putin could do. There's a lot of different things that the Russians could do. And a lot of people have many different ideas about what the Russians might do. In fact, it seems like everyone has a different idea about what they might do. And so, Matthew, tell me what you think the Russians would do if a provocation was to occur. What's their next step in escalation? And what is everyone else thinking about that? All right, so we asked everyone in the audience, if Russia ended up conducting a provocation of some sort, which event do you think Russia would do first? It looks like it's a pretty evenly split poll, with 31% saying invade Transnistria, a.k.a. Moldova. 31% also said strike Poland with an accidental missile. Good Lord, that's a hell of a voice crack. (laughs) And then we have a 25% that said invade the Sawalki Gap, also known as Lithuania, and a 14% said unsure. And on this one, I would have to say that if they did any of these options, I would have to say that Russia would most likely try to invade Transnistria first. To go in and try to invade the Solwuki Gap, that would be a hell of an escalation. That would be uh, pretty extreme, uh, especially compared to simply invading Transnistria, which is already calling for Russia's help. Uh, and basically telling them to come invade their territory to basically cause a destabilization inside of Moldova. Uh, Another second good option would be uh, Russia might strike Poland with an accidental missile, and considering the fact that a missile did cross over into Polish airspace just a few days ago, that wouldn't be too far from the truth. But Enforcer, what say you? I would have to say, if there was another escalation to be had, or the Russians were to conduct a provocation, it most likely would be an invasion of Moldova, or an accidental strike uh, on Poland with a missile, one or the other. I have a feeling that invading the Sawalki Gap is like the final culmination of, uh, of, of conflict escalation, because that would create the Third World War immediately if the Sawalki Gap was attempted to be closed. However, an accidental strike on Poland could try and send a message, and the invasion of Transnistria is something that could easily happen, or really the invasion of Moldova more so, uh, because the Russians are already in Transnistria, could easily happen, um, because... The Moldovans are a neutrally aligned country. They're not a NATO country. They're not a European Union country, hardly either. Uh, so they're quite easy to mess around with because there's really nothing that can come out of consequence of doing something in Moldova. Everything that would come out of consequence of doing something in Moldova has already happened to the Russians because of the Ukraine war from the majority of the Western world. So I have a feeling that that is most likely the next major escalation is a strike on, uh, well, an invasion of Moldova, or the next one after that would be an accidental missile strike on Poland, And then the final one would be an invasion and closure of the Sawalki Gap as an attempt by the Russians to get an upper hand at the beginning of a third world war. Uh, So with that, I hope that does address that quite well, in my opinion, quite well indeed. But before we get on into the rest of the news, uh, because we actually have a few location unknowns and also a lot of larger news coming out of the wars that are happening, or the battles that are happening all the way down the length of the front line inside of Ukraine, there are some questions that I'd like to talk about and answer, but... Really quickly, I do have to say this. I'm completely flabbergasted, blown away as a matter of fact, that there is around 11,000 people watching right now live. That is unbelievable. And if y'all are enjoying the stream, which I'm sure many of y'all are, please make sure to hit that like button. It just makes us so happy. We're already up to 31. Man, merciless. I mean, plug. man, it is merciless, man. I'm taking some notes out of your playbook, man. We got to be merciless. Like Genghis Khan up in this hoe. Y'all got to hit that like button. Y'all got to. You got to do it. Uh, but uh, it, it also helps our stream to reach further and let more people know about this news. So if you really appreciate it and you enjoy it a lot, hitting the like button is something that uh, costs absolutely nothing. And it helps out this channel an incredibly great deal to spread out and let more people know about what we talk about and how we cover the news here. And put an LSA in the chat if you really like the way we cover the news because i'd be very happy to see that but matthew what kind of questions do we have all right and our first question of the night goes to griffin provenzano who's the longtime channel legend who throws in the biggest super chat of the night a three hundred dollar donation and thank you very much griffin for that massive support and he says i just cannot donate to you and he says lag will never stop us the leaf spring army will mobilize out of spite and lsa question to the chat Hey, hey, thank you so much, Griffin. 
Provenzano for your fifth super chat in the history of this channel. Unbelievable and absolutely incredible. That is huge support. And I got to say, thank you so much, Griffin Provenzano, for wanting to support this channel and supporting us to an unbelievable degree. It helps us out massively behind the scenes. It helps us to make everything possible. And if it wasn't for folks like you, Griffin Provenzano, we wouldn't be able to keep this channel on air. And that goes for everyone who supports the channel, but especially you, Griffin Provenzano, because that support is unbelievably huge. And so, Thank you so much once again for the support. It means a great deal to us. And also, the lag will never stop us. I don't know what's up with the lag because the lag does not hit uh, sometimes and the lag hits other times. Tonight was one of those nights where the lag hit hard and it hit bad. Uh, but we still power through and the, and the news kept going and we were able to get up already to a peak of a whopping 11.2 thousand viewers, which is unbelievable. Absolutely incredible. But still... Thank you so much once again for support. And we will make sure to send that question to the chat. But I want everyone to thank Griffin Provenzano once again for the massive support that he's given to this channel. Uh, Super Chats, in case you're new to this channel, help this channel to keep running. We do not have ads on these streams, nor do we have sponsors. So the stream is entirely supported by the viewers themselves. If they enjoy it, they get to decide how much they want to support or if they support it all. And so Griffin Provenzano's support is absolutely huge and helps this channel to keep on running. And I want, everyone, I want Griffin to know that everyone greatly appreciates the unbelievable support that he's given to this channel to help it to keep running. Uh, I, I know that me and Matthew greatly appreciate it because we rely on that to be able to make this channel and this entire, uh, every, really our entire operation possible, the videos and everything in between. So thank you so much once again, Griffin Provenzano, and I hope I was able to address your support incredibly well. And with that, let's get that live chat. All right, in the live chat question, and also, by the way, folks, I'm going to apologize ahead of time. For some reason, I am losing my voice. I have no idea where that came from, and that's why my voice is cracking up and also sounding hoarse. Uh, so hopefully that gets better. But anyways, the live chat question is going to go to Urban X, who says, any suggestions on how the Belarus people feel about Lukashenko siding for Putin? Um, I have a feeling that they're pretty indifferent or they may even be supportive of it because the Belarusians and the Russians have really been lock in step ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union and have never really broken ways with that. It seems as though they're pretty dead set in keeping that up. And so I have a feeling that the Belarusian public is largely neutral or in support of Lukashenko's actions. I know that many people would say that they're probably not, but the thing is, is if they weren't, we would see some kind of action in Belarus against Lukashenko and we rarely ever really do. Uh, it's, it's kind of like a Navalny level of resistance in Belarus, which if we're taking Navalny level as being anything, it means that it isn't big enough to actually create any kind of change. Because look what happened to Navalny. He got whacked by the Russian government in a Arctic Circle gulag, pretty much. And nothing really happened as a result. Everyone cried a little bit, and then they just moved on with their lives. Uh, and so with that... I hope that does address that uh, the best I can, at least in my opinion, because I'm I'm not really thinking that there's a lot of resistance uh, in Belarus to what the Belarusian government is doing. On top of that, the Belarusians are pretty bad off. If you ever look at Belarus, and I wonder if we can, I bet you we can't, we cannot. Uh, wow, it's a dictatorship, who would have known? But if I drop you all down here, you know, I can see that the Belarusians, much like the Chinese, handpick the places that you can see, and they don't even look that good when they handpick them. Uh, so going off of that, I would assume that the Belarusians probably aren't in any kind of position to really be happy or unhappy. Uh, it's not uh, that great off of a country, and on top of that, the uh, Belarusian military, along with Lukashenko, pretty much run the country entirely, and no one really has a say in how it runs beyond the military and Lukashenko. But with that, uh, I hope that does address that question the best I can. And thank you so much once again, Griffin Provenzano, for the massive support and helping us to make that live chat possible. And with that, we are on to the next one. And our next super chat is going to go to Sinful J, who's a longtime channel legend as well, who throws in a very generous $100 Dang. donation, and that is massive support indeed. He says, long live the LSA, and congrats on the YouTube play button, and keep up the great work. And take one from the live chat, please. Hey. And Sinful J... That play button we're getting here, we're probably in about a week and a half now, and we are super excited to unbox it on camera and make a video out of it because it's going to be super cool. We're actually stoked for it, and man, it's been a long time coming. But thank you very much for that support. And Enforcer, what say you? And I have to thank you for the unbelievable support as well, Sinful J. That is incredible, and I got to thank you so much for it. And of course, long live the Lee Spring Army. Put an LSA in the chat if you agree with that. And Matthew's like, no, God, no, because when y'all do that, the chat goes like, I think it's like 500 
100 chats a minute. So that means that there's nearly like 10 chats coming in a second. So it's almost impossible to follow at all. But put an LSA in the chat if y'all agree. Uh, But beyond that, to answer your question, Simple J, uh, or more so your statement, Thank you so much for congratulating us on getting the YouTube play button. It has been a long time coming. We passed 100,000 subscribers nearly a year and a half ago, and we're all the way up to 180,000 subscribers now. We're actually to about 180,500 as of right now. Uh, And the channel has been rapidly growing, especially over just the past month. We have gained nearly 20,000 subscribers, or about 700 or so a day, each day on average. That is unbelievable growth uh, for a YouTube channel. And we are more than happy to have everyone join us as we continue to cover this news. And not only that, it's incredible to see that YouTube uh, finally recognized their channel for a creator award, where we're finally going to be getting one of those freaking elusive play buttons. Like, we we were not able to get one for the longest time. And we are finally going to be able to get one. So I'm... I'm absolutely blown away, absolutely stoked for that, and I can't wait to get it. We're actually planning on making an unboxing video for that play button, and we're probably not going to put it on the main channel. I'm probably going to throw it up on Patreon, but I'm going to make it free to view because right now our Patreon stuff is usually for the paid members only, but that one I'm going to put it on Patreon and make sure that everyone can see it whether they are a paying Patreon member or not. Uh, it's just that I don't... You know what we can also do is we can put it on a YouTube short as well. That'd probably be cool. So that way we don't have to dedicate a whole video to it, but we could put it on the shorts. Yeah, we could do that. That's a pretty good idea too. We will probably do a short and also a Patreon deal. The Patreon will actually be like a long form version of unboxing it and looking at it and everything. And we're also getting two of them, one for my room and one for Matthew's room. So that's going to be really cool too. Uh, but still, thank you so much, Simple J, for being so happy uh, and, and really celebrating with us that we finally got one of those YouTube play buttons. And we will be keeping up the great work. One thing that we are always dedicated to is keeping this stream running six days a week, every single day except for Mondays at 10 p.m. Eastern Time and making this channel a reality, making it possible. Uh, I also have to say I'm so sorry, y'all, for the intermittent video uploading schedule that we have. Uh, Many of y'all may have noticed that we didn't put out a short war summary today. The problem is is that there sometimes during those times of the day when we're trying to put out that video, a lot of news really hasn't happened yet. Like the news of NATO forces moving closer to the Lithuanian border didn't really happen until way later in the day, about four hours before this news began tonight. So sadly, we weren't able to cover that then, and so we had to save it for the stream tonight. Uh, we are trying to keep up that video upload sc- uh, schedule as best we can, but at the same time, we don't want to inundate y'all with just filler news. We want the news that we put out to y'all in these videos to actually be good and something worth watching. And so that's why sometimes we just kind of lay off on some days and then really go in heavy on making videos for an entire week because the news sometimes just is not enough to cover and we do not want to sacrifice uh, quality for quantity. Uh, we want to make sure that our news is always high quality so that way y'all can always count on us to be getting the best news out to y'all. Uh, and so with that, I hope that uh, does address that well, at least the great work side of things. We're trying our best to make sure the quality is as high as it can possibly be. And we will make sure to take one from the chat, Sinful J. And thank you once again for the for that unbelievable, incredible support. And so, Matthew, what do we got for a live chat? All right. And the live chat question is going to go to a Big Snack 100, who says, would China seize the moment and take Taiwan while forces uh, are caught up in Eastern Europe if that occurred? Can you reread that one again? Would China seize the moment and take Taiwan while forces are caught up in Eastern Europe if that occurred? I'm doubting it. Uh, The Chinese would probably be dealing with a pretty big amount of economic uh, fallout because China would be a neutral aligned country at that point. They're also going through some pretty heavy financial crisis as it is, uh, which takes a lot of inwards effort by the Communist Party of China. And so if a massive war was to break out in between Europe and Russia... The, the amount of consumer goods, because China produces nothing but consumer goods that are imported into Europe and the United States, that consumer good market would collapse pretty much within weeks, meaning that the Chinese would be losing out on hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars per year in global trade with Europe and the United States. And they would end up probably sitting there and waiting the war out, either remaining a neutral party or joining on the side of the Russians. Honestly, I have a feeling that if World War III was to begin in between Russia and the Western world, I have a feeling that China might actually set that out, um, thinking about that. Because the economic turn, uh, the economic downturn in China would probably be so severe, on top of the one that they're already having, 
that that would be pretty much the dark ages for the Chinese. They would practically be going back to what they were like in the 90s and the 80s, which was not that economically successful. Uh, they'll probably be dealing with some massive upheavals in China because of that, probably massive riots and protests. And during times like that, those are usually the worst times to try and conduct any kind of a foreign war is when there is a massive amount of civil unrest. I know a lot of people like to make a joke about Germany in World War II being in massive upheaval, but the thing is, is that Germany was in massive upheaval upheaval in the late 20s and the early 30s. After about 1932, when the Nazis came in power, the Nazis ruled Germany with an iron fist and brought everything under control. So by the time 1939 came around, Germany was actually in fairly stable condition, at least on a domestic level. And that's usually the best time to try and start a war is when things are going fairly well on the domestic level. Uh, you can also see other instances when wars were began, like for example in the Soviet Union when they invaded Afghanistan in 1979, the Soviet Union was actually not doing that bad. There was some economic stagnation that was going on because of the economic uh, planning by Brezhnev, but beyond that, the Soviet Union was not in any kind of a massive upheaval. You actually saw the war in Afghanistan end in 1989 when the Soviet Union was going through an unbelievable amount of, do of domestic and economic upheaval, and that's when they started to exit out of the world stage entirely, and the Soviet Union started to collapse before everyone's eyes. So going off of that, if the Chinese had to deal with a similar scenario while World War III was going on all around them, they'd probably just sit back and watch it happen, and then wait for it to end and hopefully resume the kind of trade that they had with Europe and the United States before that war began, and with everyone else around the world. Uh, so with that, I hope that does address that question fairly well, at least in my opinion, based off of that analysis. But once again, everyone, Take it with a grain of salt because things can change and there are a million different factors that I'm not accounting for in that analysis. So it could go really any way. But going off the analysis I gave right there, I think the Chinese would sit it out. But still, thank you so much once again, Sinful J, for that incredible support and sponsoring that live chat question because once again, folks like you help to make this channel possible. And with that, we are on to the final question of this segment and then we're going to be moving on into the Ukraine news and the Ukraine frontline news. And the final one of the segment. And goes to Leora Avagile, who's the longtime channel legend as well, hey! who throws in a $200 donation. Dang! And thank you very much, Leora, for that very generous support, massive support. And Leora said, hey, Enforcers, awesome coverage tonight. And Despacito, uh, something about the lag. <laughs> I'm loving the comic relief, despite we're getting closer to World War Three, and loving the nickname Lunchtime for Lukashenko. And on a serious note, I, I think Moldova is next on the list, but it's hard to say with a frowny face. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to say with a frowny face. The way you put that, Matthew, it sounded like a part of the super chat. Hard to say with a frowny face. I was like, well, it's easy to say with a smiley <laughs> face. <laughs> but anyways, thank you so much. I'll say with the emoji, with the emoji frowny face. Man, I've seen I've seen emojis like that before. I love them. Uh, honestly, I like those more so than the ones that you can put in on like your phone because those have no soul. But beyond that, hey, thank you so much for the massive amount of support, Leora Avagile. Thank you so much for that. That is incredible. And that is your fifth super chat to the channel. And thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you so much for enjoying the coverage. Although we are going through a little bit of lag at the beginning of the stream, I'm glad that we haven't seen any lag return since then. At least on my end, things have been going absolutely fine. And also. I would have to say that I'm trying to keep up the humor, although things are getting very tense because, you know, what can we really do? If I freak out about it, what what is my freaking out really going to do about it? So it's better just to keep things light, keep joking around and cover what's going on around the world as best we can. I hope people appreciate that about this channel. I'm guessing y'all do because there's still like 9,000 people here, even in the middle of a full on question segment. And I, I greatly appreciate everyone who's here with us right now. Um, but we try our best to deliver the news, all the breaking news, as serious, uh, as grave as it may be. And we try and do it with a little bit of a smile and maybe throw in a little joke here and there. Because my crying is not going to change the situation. So we'd rather just laugh our way through it and try and cope. Uh, but beyond that, um, I gotta say, the nickname uh, Mr. Lunchtime was actually for a fat guy who was a part of the DPR artillery at the beginning of the war, but I have a feeling that we're just going to let Lukashenko be the successor to the title, because he is a fat boy. I mean, like, has anyone seen that guy? I mean, that guy, when he falls on the ground, he actually creates a 4.0 earthquake. Like, it's no joke. Minsk is rocked when he falls. Uh, like, like, people quake, not in fear of Lukashenko. They quake from the absolute gut that this guy carries around on the front of him. Um, but beyond that, Thank you so much once again.
for, for throwing that in. And also, Moldova probably is next on the chopping block. In reality, there's the least uh, amount of concern on the Russian end, on the diplomatic level, for the fallout that would happen if they were to conduct an invasion of Moldova from Transnistria. Uh, because... It's a neutral country, much like Ukraine. Yes, everyone's going to condemn an invasion, but they've already been condemned, so it's nothing new. So they could invade Moldova and not really get that much fallout or that much consequences from it, because all the consequences that they could have ever really gotten from an invasion of Moldova already happened because they invaded Ukraine in 2022. Uh, and so with that, I hope that does address that the best I can. Um, and thank you so much once again for the unbelievable amount of support, Leora Avagile, and helping this channel to keep on running. I got to say thank you to everyone, uh, Leora, uh, Sinful J, and Griffin Provenzano, the, uh, all three of y'all, and everyone else who supported us tonight. Uh, we will be getting to everyone else here towards the latter part of the stream. We want to make sure to get to the rest of the news. But I thank everyone for continuously supporting this channel because it's crazy to think that we were able to run this thing ad-free and sponsor-free. No other YouTube channel out there does that. Uh, everyone else runs ads. Everyone has sponsors on their streams. Uh, and we don't, but we just cover the news like we do. And y'all enjoyed enough and supported enough that we're able to make this possible to do this as a living, as our actual job. Uh, and I cannot put out there how appreciative of that we are. Uh, this is my dream job. The entire time I was growing up, I wished that I could sit down and my job would be to talk about world events and war. Uh, and because that's, that's the two biggest things that I've always wanted to do my entire life beyond being the president of the United States. And somehow y'all keep making that possible for us for years now. And I got to thank y'all for that. We owe everything to y'all. And that's why we're always here. We take this so seriously to make sure that we continue uh, covering this news and carrying this on out for all of y'all. And so thank you to all of y'all. So Huge much thanks to the all say for that. And incredible things. We can't say it enough, but we just wanted to say that to y'all once again, because while it isn't near the end of the stream when we usually save those very kind statements, I want y'all to know that now early tonight, because it's absolutely incredible uh, what y'all have done for us, making this possible for me to do something that I would have only dreamed to do in my entire life. And it's it, it's still possible even well on into the future. And so thank y'all so much once again. And it's now time for us to get on into the location unknowns inside of Ukraine. Starting off with the only one we got beyond the uh, beyond the casualty report, we got to see that glide bombs were being used by the Russian Air Force today to hit some Ukrainian positions. A Ukrainian soldier filmed this from afar, and we were able to see the clip right here. <laughs> And there are the glide bombs exploding in the distance. And that's the end of the clip. But still showing the actions being taken by the Russian Air Force, as it appears that while the Su-34s did take some incredibly high casualties during the initial onset of the air bombing campaign, it now appears that those casualties have been reduced. Either they have changed their tactics, or they've increased the length of the glide range of these bombs, and they're now starting to have more successful sorties. Very concerning, and hopefully the Ukrainians can figure out how to cut down the amount of successful sorties, or at least increase the amount of Russian Air Force casualties in the conducting of these sorties. Moving on from that, we were also able to see the Russian casualty report over the past 24 hours. I hope that there is no typo oh. in this, but oh! I'm telling you what, five Bobcats, and the numbers are huge in every category. I'm telling you what, 41 vehicles and fuel tanks, 11 tanks. Man, Russia can't keep this up. I'm telling you what, where are they getting this stuff from? Mm -mm -mm. Call this munchy, because this is just delicious stuff right here. And we got to see that the numbers are, are quite high. 1,030 troops were wiped out. Nine armored personnel carriers were destroyed. 41 supply trucks were knocked out as well, as long as, as well as 11 main battle tanks, 27 artillery pieces, 25 drones, one cruise missile, one anti-aircraft system, and the five special equipment vehicles. Overall, today was an impressive day, and I'm praying that I do not see Miss Disa in the live chat say, well, the numbers is wrong. I'm like, no, because it, it's almost like every other night now that one of these numbers is a typo, but hopefully they're correct tonight. Uh, but beyond that, very nice to see that the Ukrainian defenders are holding their positions quite well and once again continuing to inflict high losses on the Russian forces as they continue to hold their ground and make sure that the Russians are not able to gain an inch and if they ever do, it was with incredibly high losses. Moving on from that and into the frontline news, we were able to see that over the past 24 hours, things have progressed quite rapidly as a matter of fact in the northeastern area. We were able to see that over these past 24 hours, Absolutely no front line changed in this entire area of the front line. 
that is how well the Ukrainian defenses are going. They, the front line, is, uh, no matter how hard the Russians are fighting, no matter how hard the Russians are pushing this front line, it's just not moving anywhere for that matter. And it looks like it probably never will. Moving on into these clips, though, we got to see why the Russians are not moving forward. We got to see that some of the Russian artillery forces were hit today by the 82nd Air Assault Brigade in the area. Here's the clip. We can see their mechanical bird dropping a bomb, as this is the Wild Division, of course. And we can see them here finding the artillery piece. This is a D-30. And we can see it firing right there, so it is an actual live operational D-30 that they found. And the Ukrainians are displeased that this thing is operational. They have decided to put it to sleep. We well, can now see the D-30 still sitting in its pit. And does anyone notice that little white orb right there that's kind of moving around a little bit? Is that a man? Hmm, I don't know. Let's find out. What is that, Matthew? Is that a man? A drone? A bird? What is it? That's a... Man. Oh, it's a drone! Oh, look at that! There's the camera! Oh. It's right there! What is this guy, deaf? Oh, blit! Suck a blit! Be stuck in the night! <laughs> Wait, no, let me sound like that guy in the clip the other day, Matthew. Yup, you did not do be a blit! Suck it! Did you hear something like that? We gotta hear that again before the stream's out tonight. Like, I gotta hear it. Oh! Did you oh, see that? Oh. They put it onto the elevation adjustment. Like, look at that. They slammed it right... Oh, my lord. That was a great hit, actually. They knocked that thing out. That thing is disabled for good. Did they really think that, like, uh, like stick roof they've got there is going to really help anything? Uh, they probably thought it would help conceal it a little bit, but I don't think it actually helped out much at all. But, Matthew, you know what? we got to introduce all the new viewers tonight to the absolutely legendary clip. Good googly move! Uh, <laughs> man. That man is caked up. Man, bricked up! Call this man a brick wall, um, because goodness gracious does that have cake. There's even icing on it. He's throwing it back. Oh no. Let's try not to laugh through it so they can hear it. <laughs> Dude, I, oh, want, dear. I want someone, you listen, I got a mission for the LSA tonight, folks. I want someone, someone out there to grab this, this rant right here, this one. <laughs> and I want that to be an auto audio file for memes of the future because this this is the best thing I've ever heard. Like it's the funniest thing. Literally, there's no there's no exaggeration. It's hilarious, and I think it deserves to be remembered. So someone Man, clip that. If if someone if someone like clipped that audio and put it over the picture of the Wojak, and you like display that at any time the Russians get like jacked up by a missile and they're like panicking and freaking out, you can put that audio over it. It'd be perfect, <laughs> dude. Every time that the Russians sit there and they uh, say the the vision was successful. <laughs> What he was actually saying? Did he, did he actually say anything of substance? I don't even know. I, I have no idea. If anyone knows Russian in the chat, please let me know what that guy said. We need a translation. I must have a translation. But we're going to be moving on from this clip and getting y'all into the rest of tonight's news, because there's still a lot that we have to cover. But moving on back into the rest of the front lines, we did get to see that, the, uh, that one of the air assault brigades in the area was able to destroy an open-air ammo depot. Chad music ensues. There goes the drone. And there it went flying away. But I'm sure it'll be back. Oh, look, there's a Russian. I think it just came crawling out of a hole like a snake or something. Oh, and there he goes into another one. Yeah, oh my lord! No wonder he went running. <laughs> the entire field is on fire now. 
Smokey the Bear is having an aneurysm, and the Russians are, are probably pulverized just from the shockwave of this explosion. And when you see the drone panning around like it's shocked, no one else heard it. And look at that giant smoke ring. Wow, it's like Wile E. Coyote came to town. Dude, it's like the hot dog man is out there smoking the kush. Oh, Aww, <laughs> he sure is. Oh, man. <laughs> but beyond that, oh, dear. that's the end of that clip. And we're going to be moving on from that and out of the northeastern area and towards the Cremena Forest. We were able to see down here today that there was quite a bit of juice going on. Over the past 24 hours, not a damn thing. Y'all heard it. <laughs> because I got to tell you this. Whenever you see a front line not moving at this point in the war deeper into Ukraine, that is a Ukrainian battle that is being won right there. Because the Russians are the ones that are on the offensive in Kremena, in the northeast, in Bakhmut, and in Evdivka. So, and also, uh, the only place that the Russians are not on the offensive is in the southern front, where it appears that no one is conducting any kind of action. So, you ever see a front line that is just simply not moving in any of these areas, that means that the Ukrainians are winning a defensive battle, and it appears that they're once again continuing to win in the Kremena Forest today. But moving you all down in here, we got to see that the Russians were trying to conduct a bombardment of Terni, which is right here in this clip. And we see the uh, bombardment continuing on the town. Oh no, there's a drone somewhere. Uh, that was concerning, Zani. I started getting yeah. scared myself. It's like, uh oh. <laughs> Dude, that looks like that meme of Willem Dafoe looking up into the sky. I gotta go find that meme. <laughs> Willem Dafoe um, looking up meme. Here we go. I found it. <laughs> Wait, hang on. Oh no. <laughs> Dude, when I heard that sound of that drone, I was behind the computer looking like that. I'm not gonna lie, man. I was like, I was like, oh god. <laughs> That's like, or that guy said, oh no, 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 no. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> but luckily it was a Ukrainian drum because it sounded like it was coming in the land uh, so that's that's lucky but moving on from that and into our next clip we also got to see that a Russian MT Rapira got hit by the way, just to explain really quickly, uh, there the MT uh, the MTLB is a armored personnel carrier that is used by the Ukrainians and the Soviet Union. But the Ukrainians and the Soviets have modified some of these uh, MTLBs to carry the 100 millimeter MT-12 Rapira anti tank gun. So earlier on in the war, we just decided that we're going to call these vehicles the MT Rapira. Uh, so that's why we're calling it the MT Rapira, just in case you never heard about that armored vehicle before. But we can see one of these MT Rapiras right here, and it's about to be targeted and destroyed by a Ukrainian drone. And there we go right there, hitting onto the MT Rapira and knocking it out. We now see the fire is consuming the vehicle. And brewing it up. Like a nice cuppa. I Yorkshire tea. It's the best tea, governor. A nice cup of hot uh, Yorkshire tea. I'm telling you, it's the best stuff. Man, call out Smokey the Bear, or uh, what's the what's the Russian version of Smokey the Bear? I forgot, but it's that ugly, ugly bear. stupid thing. Yeah, <laughs> something like that, maybe. But that's the end of that clip, and we're moving on to our next. Suka Bear. Suka Wait, hang on. Let me Russian Smokey the Bear. It's not like cracked and doped out looking bear. Uh, let's see. Russian fire prevention mascot. <laughs> oh my god! What the is it hell? Bear? No, it's worse! What is this thing? Oh my, so hang well, on, I gotta read I the caption. See. Hang on. Russia's Federal Emergency Management Agency has rolled out a new mascot to teach kids about fire prevention. The Russian Smokey the Bear is an anthropomorphic, uh, anthropomorphic cookie, uh, and it's called Prianik. 
this thing is this thing is the source of nightmares, Matthew. I'm not building this thing up just to hype people up to see it. I didn't know that the Russians had such a god awful, ugly looking creation as their Smokey the Bear. That thing. Oh my! That's a bear? No, it's a cookie or something like that. Man, it looks like a piece of French toast crying. Oh my god! What in the oh hell is god. that, man? That is nightmare fuel. <laughs> oh dear god, <laughs> man! You gotta watch out for him. Like, don't let your kids around that thing. Dude, why the hell does it have an expression like that? What is oh. this? <laughs> It looks like it's like going, oh. <laughs> Dude, you know what it looks like it's doing? It looks like it's going, oh, man. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's it's what it looks like it's doing. Yeah. <laughs> he's got a new job. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh the hot oh, dog man is employed. He's got, he finally got a job, man. Oh, Congratulations. Oh, my God. It looks so ugly. <laughs> it's oh, dear. Like, <laughs> what the hell is it? <laughs> oh, I'm dying over here. I'm trying to get breath right now. <laughs> Dude, why the hell does this look like a mugshot in this picture? <laughs> like, what is this? And then there's a picture of Putin in the background. You can see it up there. It's just that you can't see his face. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my God. Oh, dear God. <laughs> oh. <laughs> why? Why? Why would they pick this? They could have picked anything else. Like, Smokey the Bear is So, cute. wait. They don't have Bliad Berries? I could have sworn we saw a bear that they had before. Like, they have a bear. I know they do. I think it was a it's Canadian. It's a crack bear. It's like the local crack dealer bear for the uh, fire prevention crap. I think it was a Canadian mascot kind of a thing. But look, like, a Smokey the Bear is cute. Like, it's like, oh, look, it's a bear wearing blue jeans and a little, <laughs> a little like, mounty hat, uh, you know, or, or like a frontier hat. Not bad. Kind of cool looking. Then you got this thing. What the hell is that? Like, <laughs> what the hell is this supposed to be? Ugh. Why does it look like it's crying? It's like they modeled teardrops onto the side of its eyes. That thing's horrifying. They didn't even, like, stick the patches onto the, like, costume at all. Like, this is the most poorly put together thing. It's like they ripped it out of some something else and just threw that head onto, uh, like, a shirt. And, and look at this. People in the chat are going off. They better watch out yeah, over there. We better watch out. We better watch out. I, I was just thinking about that. You never know what's going to pop up. Romania. Um, but beyond that, oh Aww. my god, <laughs> this is horrendous. Oh, yeah, we're going to have to get that off the screen. But moving on from that, we now know what the Russian Smokey the Bear looks like, and it's apparently an ugly ass cookie. Moving on from that, we got to see a Russian toss getting blown up in the Kremenov Forest today as well. Here's the toss. It's rolling around down there. Here comes the drone. It's going to impact onto the toss. Bada boom, jaga jaga hits the back of the launcher. We are not. It looks like a little fire was started on the street. It looks like some uh, some glints of fire are kicking off, but it looks like the drone's going to have to hit one of the rockets that's actually in the launcher to really exp uh, destroy this toss. Boom. A bada boom, jigga jigga. That's the end of the clip, but nice to see that they tried to take out that toss in the Cremena Forest area. Moving on out of the Cremena Forest and down into Bachmut, we haven't gotten any video or picture evidence from this area again. It appears to be a, a somewhat quieter area of the front lines. And once again, the Russians have advanced not a damn anywhere because the Ukrainians are holding them back. Moving on down into the Abdivka area, we also got to see that over the past 24 hours, it appears that Russian forces were able to make a small advance towards the town of Berdichi. Uh, we could see this right here. So it looks like they're starting to move a little bit farther onto the village chain. But once again, it looks like the Ukrainians are holding them there. Moving on from that and into the only two clips we have in this area, we were able to see an M1126 striker firing onto the Russians. This is an American armored personnel carrier provided to the Ukrainians at an earlier date. Here's the clip. All right, we're going to be muting that. But we can see them firing into the tree line. They've got the battle override turned on, so you know the business is going down. Man, you know they they absolutely smoking these <laughs> smoking these fools. You know what I mean? Man, it's like the uh, like the reality equivalent of turning on OP mode or something. Man, I like it. And then it says firing and naval armed. <laughs> like it's just all caps armed. Uh, but that's the end of the clip. Nice to see the striker doing its thing. Moving on from that and into our next clip, we got to see that the Russians finally tried to destroy the abandoned Abrams on the road near Berdichi. This thing has been disabled and abandoned for quite a while, and it appears that the Russians attempted to destroy this Abrams today. 
Uh, maybe because they are possibly not expecting to be able to salvage the abandoned Abrams like they probably wanted to, and so they're going to destroy it so that way the Ukrainians can't recover it either. But one thing y'all might notice is that they show us no clear proof that the Abrams burned on down and was completely destroyed, so I think that these hits may have just kind of like uh, left some splotching on the external armor, but didn't actually cause any serious damage. Moving on from that and out of the Avdivka area, it's time for us to move out of the Donetsk region and down into the Zaporizhia front, where we did get to see a couple of clips that kind of revolved around the Robotine front today. Starting off at Basan, we got to see that some Orlan operators were greased by, uh, by Ukrainian artillery. Check it out. All right, there's the Orlan operators down there. For some reason, they use these highly reflective-looking uh, paint jobs on the Orlons that really give them away. Kind of stupid, if you ask me. I, I would paint them like gray or something, so that way they wouldn't reflect the light that much. But, you know, the, let the Russians do whatever the hell they want. You know, if, if it ends up getting them wiped out quicker, I, I guess I'm for it. And also, by the way, the caked-up guy in that ATGM video was absolutely being an utter foul mouth. Like, I got some people like that translated in the chat that know Russian. That guy was swearing up a storm. <laughs> Man, his mother would not be happy, I'm telling you. Mm. That's if, if, if he even knows his mother, Matthew. Oh. Oh. Oh, bleat. Oh, Chris is mine. <laughs> oh, oh, man. Oh, man. But anyways, we got to see the little Orlon headquarters get here. Here, We can see the video is having a buffering issue. Uh, not on our end. It's, it's on their end when they were filming it. And Gerald Mansfield, Gerald Mansfield said, Convenient you don't drink. And I agree. I think it's great that we don't drink. Because it, we're sober enough to do this every day. And also... Um, you know, it, it, it's just, it's just something I generally avoid. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because if we were to get intoxicated, you might have to skip streams every once in a while. Like, uh, some, oh man. Oh man. I was out partying hard. Oh, but anyways, moving on from that and into our next clip, we also got to see that a Nona SPG was blown up a pretty good ways back. Uh, we actually geolocated this clip earlier. So the mark is accurate on the map, but there's the Nona getting splattered right below the drone. And that Nona is no mo. With that, that's the end of that clip right there. And it's time for us to move on from that clip and on into our next one near Nova Pro Kabivka, where we got to see some Russians running for them hills uh, after their Chinese buggy came after uh, came under Ukrainian drone attack. <clears throat> Excuse me, heavy rock ensues. There goes the Russians. Uh, there's like nine of them oh. in this thing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the golf cart got hit. How'd they pack into that thing that many people? I don't even know. Like, look at this, dude. Like, the dimensions of the cart don't even allow for that many people to be on it. Watch. One, two, three, four, five, that six. That thing never had a hope in hell of moving. Seven. That's probably why it didn't move, is because they had seven guys sitting on it. What kind of idiots are these people? But anyways, moving on from that. And out of that clip, it appears that the Chinese Chinesium powered golf cart was not able to get the raw horsepower or vril to be able to move seven full cowardly Russians off the battlefield. So it ended up getting smacked by a drone and seven guys went running for the hills. Moving on from the clown car, we're now moving on down to the Harrison area where we were able to see that Mandiar's birds were able to get back at some of those Russians as they got them on a river. Oh my, well apparently it was a little it was a little too spicy, so we can't show that one. Moving on down into the area of Radinsk, we also got to see that a Russian command post got destroyed today by I believe the 37th Brigade. Actually, this is the uh first battalion um of the Morskoy uh Pihoti, so I don't know what that is, but here it is. All right, they got the trap playing. They got the trap in the trap house. And we can see that the Russians got trapped in their own trap house. <laughs> Pun intended. Let us go into this building in plain bleat. Yes, let us plan. Handshake, handshake. Very smart, very genius. We see them wandering away into the headquarters to go into the planning bleat. Hello, handshake. I will make you eat shit on a rusty spoon later. Uh, they climb into the basement <laughs> to do their little military scheming, little military planning. 
Oh, oh my Scooby. god, he's, he's, he's out. Like <laughs> Zoink Scoob, I think this is the haunted house. Rat Ra Raggy ghost him. <laughs> and they're about to get turned into ghosts here in a second. You about to see something ghoulish happen. Here we go. Two but two SC two fifty bombs, I believe, hit the building on both sides simultaneously. Boom. Knocked it out. Completely gone. Like, Zoink Scoob, I think we just got hit with a bomb. Roll, roll, Raggy, detonation. Like, Zoink Scoob, it's down to the foundation. Rat, rat, Raggy, no insurance. <laughs> but beyond that, <laughs> that building is gone. We see some Russians walking around outside playing the world's smallest violin. <laughs> but beyond that, I see in that clip. I don't know what the hell I was trying to do there. I was trying to do the world's smallest fly lane, but it sounded like static. Moving on from that and up into the area of Saki, we got to see some more Russian command posts. Oh, I'm sorry. That's actually a duplicate. Correction. Oh, we didn't get to see more Russian command posts getting knocked out. It was just the same one down there. Then, all the way down in Shula Kivka, which we hardly ever hear about this direction, by the way. This is near to the area of the Kimburn Spit or the Black Sea Biosphere Reserve of NAS. I don't. Uh, biosphere Reserve sounds like some kind of a sphere of like just like gelatinous material just sitting around near the Kimburn Spit. But beyond that, this is Chulakivka, a little town filled with Ukrainian people that are occupied by the Russians. And you know something that the Ukrainians in this town don't like? Being occupied by the Russians. So guess what? They decided to do something about it. More so the Ukrainians on the other side of the river decided to do something about it. And they ended up nuking uh, the Orlon team down here. Oh my god, it's a duplicate. Why in the world did I have a duplicate down there too? Anyways, we're going to be deleting that. And moving on out of the area of Harrison and up into the area of Kiev to cover the speech from President Volodymyr Zelensky. It is time. It is that time of night. Get ready, everyone. Strap in. This is one hell of a uh, one hell of a speech. And so, without further ado, here is the speech. 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 Дорогі українці, українки, сьогодні Сумщина з командою весь день тут. Спочатку наші військові відвідав наших хлопців, які лікуються після поранень, відзначив державними нагородами. Великий, великий вдячність, великий уклін лікарям, усім медичним сестричкам, кожному, хто допомагає відновлюватись після поранень. Друге за сьогодні це, звичайно, всі питання захисту Сумщини, кожної громади, кожного міста, особливо складно у прикордонні, там постійний російський терор, там постійні обстріли, авіаційні удари, протидія диверсійним групам ворога. Я вдячний усім солдатам, всім командирам і Збройних сил, і воїнам прикордонної служби, і нашим поліцейським, і Нацгвардії, Служба безпеки в Україні, усім, хто задіяний, усім, хто захищає. Дякую, що не дозволяєте перетворити нашу землю на зону російської присутності. Кожен окупант, в який посміє заходити сюди, буде знищений провів тривалу координаційну нараду. Пройшлися і по питаннях внутрішньої безпеки в області. Від укриттів до протидії злочинності і по всіх питаннях оборони. Дуже предметно. Щодо економіки, до соціальної ситуації. Зараз спільне завдання і уряду, і обласної влади, і керівників громад дати всі можливості, щоб тут у нашій Сумській області були робочі місця, щоб працював соціальний захист, щоб були надійні надходження до бюджету. Вперше провели регіональну зустріч щодо нашої нової програми економічної політики, зроблено в Україні. Є суттєвий обсяг коштів на цей рік, на всі регіони нашої держави. Гарантовано і на Сумську область. Є цілком конкретні завдання для урядовців, для фонду Держмайна, для Офісу Президента, для обласної влади за підсумками зустрічі та нарад тут сьогодні. І є підписані контракти для нашого оборонно-промислового комплексу. І я пишаюся тим, що з кожним місяцем все більше і більше компаній, все більше розробників пропонують конкретні зразки зброї, снарядів, техніки, машин для розмінування, 
багатьох інших речей. І усього того, що так потрібно на фронті, і що завдяки силі технологій зберігатиме життя наших, наших людей. Зокрема, за сьогодні є нові контракти на автоматизовані системи ведення вогню, нові FPV-дрони з відповідними скидами, тренажери для мобільних вогневих груп, які допомагають ефективніше збивати шахеди. Все те, що дійсно потрібно. І ще одне, те, що особливо надихає. Я зустрівся зі студентами, які навчаються тут, в університеті, а тут на Сумщині, які так, очевидно, хочуть, щоб в Україні все, все вдавалося, щоб ми вигравали, щоб можна було жити і розвиватись тут у себе вдома в Україні. Все для цього зробимо. Україна вміє бути сильною. Маємо щодня додавати нашій державі, нашим людям впевненості. І, будь ласка, завжди будьте вдячними тим, хто зберігає нормальне життя в нашій державі, в усіх наших громадах. Дякую тобі, Сумщину. Слава Україні! And hurrah, hear him slower. And I feel like he was uh, doing like a teaser advertisement for eFarm Pro in the background. That's a nice tractor. I had to say, man, that was a sick whip back there. And I wonder if Zelensky rode that all the way from Kiev. <laughs> like that was his whip in the background. He's just like, hello, everyone. I'm in Sumi. I rode this thing into town. It's kind of nice. Make said, sure to get one. He, I rode this into town. They think my tractor is sexy. <laughs> it really turns them on. <laughs> it really gets them going, you know. And most importantly, it gets the Russians piecing their pants because they know this thing can really steal a tank. This bad boy can lift a whole tank. <laughs> it can jack a whole tank off of a Russian platoon. I swear to God. But beyond that, that is the end of Zelensky's speech while we're absolutely tweaking over here. Uh, and it is time for us to move on into the question segment and get to talk to all of y'all it is the most fun time of night to me and i also have to say that i'm very honored that 7600 people are still here watching right now that is insane to me because it is the it's the beginning of the question segment now and usually at this point nearly like 4000 to 3700 people will be watching by this point in the stream and there's 7600 people still here right now tonight uh, we are entirely honored to have nearly 11.2 thousand of y'all watching tonight. That was unbelievable to me. And I'm absolutely blown away that so many people have once again come to watch this stream and get the night's news. Uh, if y'all have enjoyed it so far, make sure to hit that like button. We're up to 4,600 likes, and every single like helps us to, uh, a little bit in the algorithms to reach out further to more people. And if you enjoyed this, please share the opportunity to other people for them to possibly get on the stream and enjoy it too. And the easiest way to do that is by hitting that like button. It's absolutely free. It's absolutely simple to do. And it does nothing but help us. And it, also you get a little benefit out of it because you get to go into the live chat and say, I hit the like button. And then Matthew might go, Hey, thank you. Bless you. And then you'll be feel like, Oh, hey. you know, and then you'll feel great and all wholesome and warm and everything. Or you can treat the like button like it owes you money and beat the hell out of that thing. Either way, it's a win-win for you and it's a win-win for us. Uh, but with that, it's time for us to start talking a little bit more in depth about some of the questions that we've asked y'all since the last time we all talked in the last question segment. Uh, and, and we've heard that Ukraine has launched a massive attack in Belgrade. And we are wondering, will they take it to Moscow again? Will they? Will they do it? Really? For real? For real? Uh, and, and Matthew, what do you think about that? And what does everyone else think about that? So now that we're seeing uh, Belgrade is still under major attack, not just by the Freedom of Russia Legion, but also Ukraine with the shelling attacks as well, the question is, will the rebels still make it to Moscow? 30% uh, said yes, they will. 29% said no, they're already being stalled. 24% said I need more info first. And 17% uh, were undecided. And on this one, I got to say that the momentum was going very strong in the beginning for the Freedom of Russia Legion. And the momentum is still going, but it's not quite as fast as it was. And while Belgorod is still under massive attack, we haven't seen these forces, these rebels, make their way past Belgorod just yet. So it does seem like they may have been stalled just a little bit. But I don't think we should give up on them yet. And I think with enough uh, shelling of Belgrade, that place may become uh, an absolute hellhole in the future and allow those uh, rebels to make their way through and on uh, maybe maybe to the next town. Maybe not to Moscow just yet, um, but they are making their way there over time. Uh, but Enforcer, what say you? 
I would say uh, right now, I don't think the free Russian army is going to be taking anything to Moscow. They are, it's going to be a feat if they take Belgrade. It would be a miracle if they take Stary Oskol. I don't think they're going to be making it to Moscow anytime soon because they're not moving at the kind of speed where Moscow is even in the headlights at this moment. It's way out there in the distance and they'll have to uh, work a really long and hard ways to be able to get to the uh, footsteps or more so the uh, gates of Moscow. Uh, so with that, I hope that does address that, at least in my opinion. But still, I got a lot of faith in those Free Russian Army guys because they're the only people that I've seen bring the war to Russia and now they're staying there permanently and it brought the war as a permanent attraction to the Belgrade Oblast. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that well. And we are on to the next one. And now moving back into our Super Chat segment. Up first, we have a very generous $70 donation Dang. from the channel legend BC Skyman, hey. who's an absolute legend indeed. And he left us two super stickers. And the one that I saw last, let me see what it uh, had on it. I can't remember it right off the bat. It was the Doge. It is jumping up in the <laughs> sea of fireworks going berserk. It is so happy. And its arms are so short. Uh, but that's not holding it up. But Enforcer, uh, what say you? Man, I got to tell you, man, that, that Shiba Inu is so crazy. Uh, and by the way, if y'all are wondering, what is that? That's just the way we say crazy behind the scenes, uh, Matthew and me together. Like, whenever we see anything crazy, like, you know, I, I don't know anything. We we'll go, man, that's so crazy. And like, I don't know why, but we just do it. So that that's a little inside joke in between Matthew and me that we share with all of y'all, the thousands of y'all who that's are here right now. Multi towers, by the way. That's the way Manuel used to say, um, a little crazy. Oh, I didn't even know. I just thought we, you just did that out of the blue one day. And I just started <laughs> yeah. running with it, man. I was like, I was no, like, oh, man, I don't have a faulty towers. <laughs> man, but, but it, it, that, that Shiva in the so crossa. But beyond that, thank you so much for the massive support, BC Skyman, both in your first uh, super chat with the uh, robotic cyborg hippo saying OP. And thank you so much for saying we're OP. Uh, and also the Shiba Inu that is rapidly waving its hands in the air like it just don't care. Thank you so much for both of those super chats. BC Skyman. You have helped this channel to keep running for quite a long time. And if it wasn't for folks like you, we wouldn't be able to make this channel possible. And so I just greatly appreciate you for being here with us forever, enjoying this channel a lot, and making the decision so many times, an endless amount of times, that this channel is worth supporting and helping to keep the channel running. And so with that, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one, also, BC Sky, I'm actually throwing a question, and we're going to take that because uh, I didn't see a question come in earlier, and I saw BC was having a problem with his Super Chat. So he said, Matt, did you hear that South Korea is sending the 120 millimeter shell? Um, I have not, actually. Uh, that's fairly interesting here. They do use a K2. Have, have, have y'all seen the uh, South Korean main battle tank? Have you? Hmm? I haven't, personally. You have not? Shame! I uh, okay. have not. So, this is it. The K2 Panther. Black Panther, actually. That's not bad. Um, it looks pretty good. K2 Black Panther. <clears throat> looks like a Abrams a little bit. K2 Black Panther. Who makes this? Um, no, I forgot who it was. Let me go up to the top. Maybe you'll tell us up here. Um, let's see here. Manufactured by well, Hyundai, Hyundai Rotom. Yeah, it's, it's actually manufactured oh. by Hyundai Rotom. Uh, and this is like a... Hyundai. Let's see. Is a South Korean company that manufactures rolling stock, defense products, and plant equipment. It is a part of the Hyundai Motor Group, which is the Hyundai that we know. So it's like, a, it's like akin to the uh, Santa Fe, basically. It's like the SUV. Pretty much, yeah. Like, it's a, it's a, it's a cousin of the Santa Fe. Uh, but beyond that, man, there's some 120 millimeter shells that they set out in front of this thing. I think these are actually, oh, wait a minute, this has the Heat MPT, High Explosive Anti-Tank MPT. I don't know what that stands for, but, hmm, interesting. Let's see here. Let me look around really quickly. I don't know what the hell the MPT stands for. I've seen Heat before. But I don't know what the MPT stands for. But beyond that, we can also see a platoon of K2s here conducting a fire drill, uh, which is really oh, that, cool. That, that is a lovely, satisfying shot right there. That is nice. How they caught the shell or that, uh, the, yeah, the shell in that shot is beyond me. 
Uh, and also, by the way, the K2 is an absolute monster of a tank. Like, these things are actually really good for what they what they do. Uh, here's one right here, fording a shallow river, and also firing off its version of smoke grenades. I don't like these smoke grenades, me honestly, like me personally. I think they're kind of a little goofy, and they don't really work that well. But they're still pretty cool looking. Uh, and then we can also see... Also, this BC, said, BC said it may be the 105 millimeter shells, actually. Um, if it's the 120 millimeter, I haven't heard about those. And if it's 105, I haven't heard about those either because usually Eastern Asian countries are very few and far in between in the amount of support that they give to Europe just because it's it's largely uh, not really that feasible or sensible for them to send equipment really all the way around the world to the other side. For America, it's another story because that's how we do everything. But for the East Asian countries, it doesn't really make a lot of sense for them. Also considering how tense the situation is in East Asia, a lot of them don't really want to give up ammunition that might have to be used in years down the road but uh with that i hope that addresses at least my ignorance of that fairly well uh and thank you so much bc skyman for asking that question it's just sadly i don't really know a lot about the east asian countries and their support to ukraine because there just isn't a lot of it from what i know but i might be wrong with that but still Thank you so much once again for the amazing, impressive, and high support that you've given to the channel tonight and helping it to keep on running. And with that, we are on to the next one. And our next Super Chat is going to go to Walter A. Lakota Jr., the channel legend hey! as well. And we got all the coming out tonight. He puts in a $50 donation. And thank you very much, Walter, for that support. Walter. He said, Aloha, and the Enforcer, Enforcer Matt, and LSA from OG Ellison Boson. He says, it seems a climax is coming soon in this Ukrainian-Russian war, and it just has an underlying tone that's accumulating to the summertime. And take one from the chat. In the summertime when the weather is fine. Copyright. <laughs> but beyond that, thank you so much for the massive support, Walter E. Lakota. The OG Elson Boson. I was going to say it in unison with Matthew tonight, but for some reason I always feel like Matthew gets thrown off when I do that. <laughs> because I think it's out of sync or something. It sounds like it's in sync to me. It is. It's, it's very out of sync. I was, I'm always reading it, and I'm like, on to the next sentence. I'll be like, you said Boson. And I'm like, what the hell, man? I'm in the middle of the next sentence. <laughs> uh, but beyond that, uh, I would have to say that it does seem like it's building up to a massive crescendo this summer, uh, or this year for that matter. Maybe not even the summer, maybe the fall. Uh, but it does seem like it's building up to a massive crescendo because things seem to be escalating a lot more this year than they were in prior years, even compared to the official statements of what the actions were showing. Um, this, this year seems like it may be the year, the year that things really do reach their peak for the war. Uh, because... It does have that underlying tone, you know, with how NATO is reacting, with Russian diplomats being expelled in large numbers, with uh, NATO movements around the Sawalki Gap, with everything going on, and also Ukraine starting to get very aggressive and striking deep into Russia. It, it seems like everything will most likely be coming to an head. Uh, but still... Thank you so much once again for supporting your it's astute observation, Walter E. Lakota. And I gotta thank you once again for being the OG Ellison Boson. You are the legit OG Ellison Boson. We still have those uh, uh those challenge coins, the ship coins, uh from the USNS Loyal that you sent. Mine's on my desk right here, right now. And I gotta thank you so much for sending those because every time you send in the super chat, I always look at that ship coin. Uh, but still, thank you so much once again, and we will make sure to take one from the chat. And so what do we got, Matthew? And the question from the chat goes to Vilson one who says, what's your thoughts on China invading Russia once they get weaker and push their forces east? I have a feeling that that is mostly unlikely um, because the thing is, is that there is a decent amount of administrative costs that the Russians uh, have to undertake while controlling the area of eastern Russia. And they don't really get much benefit out of it, rather than the than the raw materials that they get out of the region, such as timber and a couple of others. I think nickel and some things like that. So there isn't really a lot that they get out of eastern Russia uh, to really make a profit off of. So they are kind of breaking even or just making a little bit more money um, out of the region than what they're putting in. If the Chinese were to invade the area and take it over from the Russians... That now means that the Chinese are the ones that are just nearly breaking even in the area. Right now, the Chinese get a massive benefit out of Russian trade. And it really is because of a lot of this eastern Russian area that's just filled with raw materials that they buy at the cheapest of prices. And they don't have to spend any administrative costs running this area of Russia. So I have a feeling they probably wouldn't want to invade. And on top of that, countries really just aren't into the concept, like it is a modern idea of invading and taking land for resources anymore. Usually countries try like the Chinese did uh, with the Belt and Road program, which looks like it's honestly starting to fail already. Um, but 
they'll try and economically tie a country to the Chinese where they're indebted to them, and they pretty much get control over a country that way. Uganda is probably the best example that I can give, because the Chinese completely subsidized the Ugandan railways, uh, and, they, and that was the only reason that Uganda really has any operational railways in their country right now, and the Ugandans defaulted on the loan because it was pretty much a shark loan that the Chinese gave them. So now the country of Uganda is pretty much defaulted on the loan and they're permanently indebted to the Chinese. So the Chinese get complete control over Uganda and all of its natural resources that they would want inside of their country. So they pretty much get to get all of the benefits of controlling Uganda, but they get none of the negatives because the Ugandan government is the one taking on all the negatives. So it's a very parasitic relationship as far as it goes diplomatically. And I feel like that's the kind of parasitic relationship that they're going to be trying to pursue with the Russians. Instead of directly taking it over and making it a part of China, they're just going to allow the Russians to control it and pay the costs of running this part of Russia, and they're going to get nothing but the benefits out of it. Uh, so I hope that does address that well, uh, at least in my opinion. Um, because I think that's that's most likely what they're going for. I think a, a, a uh, Chinese invasion of Russia is probably one of the most unlikely things to happen this century. Uh, it's like uh, like I'm I'm gonna say that and then eat my foot in like a year when it happens. I'm gonna be like, what the hell? Uh, but that's that's honestly what I'm thinking right now. And so with that, thank you so much once again for support. I hope that does address that fairly well. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the, the next one goes to Charles Hazlitt, who puts in a $50 donation, a massive uh, support. And Charles is, of course, the longtime channel legend as well. And I feel like I'm saying that for basically everyone tonight. The, the legends are out in force. Legend. And Charles does not leave a comment from what I can see. But thank you very much, Charles, for that support. And Enforcer, what say you? And I got to thank you, Charles, Has Charles Hazlitt, for the unbelievable support. You didn't even throw in a comment. You just threw in the support and said, peace. But I got to appreciate that. And I got to thank you so much for the support and helping this channel to keep on running. Folks like you make this thing possible day in and day out, day after day, night after night. And if it wasn't for folks like you, we wouldn't be able to be here doing our thing and making this possible. And so thank you so much once again, Charles Haslam, for the support. I hope that does address that the best I can, the absolute best I can. And thank you so much once again for being an absolute legend. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one is another generous fifty dollar donation. This time from hey! Anita, blank, 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 um, something. Jenna, last name Tolls. It's getting worse. <laughs> it's getting worse. Aww. I'm telling you. But thank you very much for the support. It's getting more profane. Uh, they said down with Putin, but I can't agree with that though. Down with Putin. I'm telling you. Dang! I just saw it. Oh my god! <laughs> wow! <Yeah. laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, but but still, down with Putin. I'll agree on that. <laughs> thank you so much. For the massive support and helping this channel to keep on running, Jenna Tolls. Uh, because if it wasn't for folks like you, we wouldn't be able to help make this channel possible and we wouldn't be able to get whiplash from the absolutely crazy name that you have. Uh, but with that, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And it's great to have you tonight. It's like a breath of fresh air. Uh, and so with that, thank you. Thank you greatly. And with that, we are on to the next one. In our next one is going to go to Panama Floyd, also the legend. He puts uh, in a $50 donation uh, and says, in reference to the humor, I call it melancholy chuckling. He says, have to laugh to keep from tearing up, tearing up. Uh, one from the chat, please. <laughs> have to, have <laughs> to tearing up or tearing up, either one. I have to stop myself from tearing up. <laughs> Captain, she's tearing herself apart. <laughs> Beyond that. No, I, Scotty. Put it to the limit, man. Captain, she can't take much more of it. Uh, man, that's, that's honestly what and I a say. grip, Scotty. Man, that, that's, <laughs> Wait a minute, that doctor, Dr. McCoy comes into the picture. Shut up, man. This, I'm a doctor. I'm not a mechanic. Damn it, Jim. I'm a doctor, not a mechanic. Who asked you even? <laughs> like, you just came up here and just started saying this. Who even asked you? Man, Why are you giving us a smoke? Dr. Dr. McCoy was always pressed for no reason. Every time he came around, he was always acting pressed. <laughs> Ben, you, you could go down there and he'd literally be doing nothing, sitting there on that stupid computer, shoving the discs into it. And Captain Kirby would be like, uh, what's going on, Bones? He'd be like, damn it, Jim, I'm busy. <laughs> it's just like, what's wrong with you, man? Like, calm down. Just calm down. Take a quaalude like, or something. But beyond that, beyond that, I got to say, Panama Floyd, thank you for the massive support. You are our two chairs, two chairs, Panama. And I got to thank you for that because we actually do have viewers in Panama. Um, but beyond that, I got to thank you so much once again for support. And I would have to say, thank you for calling it melancholy chuckling. Um, and, and that's something that I always believe in massively. Because there are two different kinds of YouTubers out there. There's us, 
And then there's everyone else. Uh, and I'm not even kidding about that. There's just no one else that does this the way we do it. And here's the way that everyone else does it, and here's the way we do it. Everyone else cries their way through it, they act really serious, and they act like nothing could be a laughing matter. And then we go through it, and it's serious, yeah, but we joke through it. Uh, and so we, we make it a lot more lighter to get through and listen to as far as the news goes. And believe it or not, y'all, believe it or not, everyone who cries about the war doesn't change the situation. And when we laugh about it, we don't change the situation either. It's just completely different ways that you hear the news. Really, this is really mostly the same news, although we usually get it quicker than most other people. Um, but it's, it's pretty much the same news, just different uh, delivery styles. Uh, and that's something that... I just have to hit home every single day. People act like us laughing at this um, or, or trying to make a light of it. Not really laughing at it, but more so just trying to make a light of the war uh, is a terrible thing. And to that, I say, what would happen if we acted the opposite? Like, what would that actually change? And the reality is, is that it would change absolutely nothing. It's just that everyone on this channel would be sad and depressed and it wouldn't change a single thing. Y'all would just feel worse for no reason. Uh, so... That's why we keep up that kind of a tone, because I find it to be very important to do that. Uh, and people just don't get that. Wars last a long time. They're brutal. If you ever just pay attention to a war, they're freaking brutal. So the best thing to do is to just keep up a high spirit and try and truck on along. Um, because if you, you know, if you try to cry through the whole thing, you're probably going to end up wanting the war to end and will do anything to make it end because you just wanted to stop, make the pain stop, instead of kind of trying to keep up a high spirit and then getting to the point where you can win. Um, so I hope that does address that well. And I saw someone bring up someone that I don't even know who the hell they are. They said, you're wrong. So-and-so is humorous. I don't know who that is. Like, like the only person I know that does this the way we do is us. I like, respect to them, whoever they are. Um, you know, I'm not dissing on them or anything. I just don't know who they are. So, uh, when you say you're wrong and act like we should know, I, I don't even know who that person is. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that well. I'm sure we'll have another hit piece made on us because I said that because because everyone in the world acts like we have to know who they are. And and you know, the honest truth is we're so busy behind the scenes. Uh, I don't really know, like, half the people that are brought up here. Like, people are like, hey, have you seen so-and-so's channel? I'm like, I have not. Because we just, we are running this thing all day, every day. We're really focusing on our own lane. And sometimes rarely on other channels when they're brought up to us because they're threatening us or something. And then we go look at them. Um, but beyond that, I don't really make it a passion of mine to go around looking at many people throughout the Ukraine war world. Uh, and so the real, the real question is, has, has so-and-so seen our channel? That's the real question. Yeah, that's the real question. Um, because, <laughs> it, 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 because, because, but nobody's asking and nobody even asked that man, man, I'm telling you, man, no one even, no one, oh man, I'm telling you, I get no respect around here. Oh man. The other day I woke up and I had a heaviness over me and sometimes I talk to it and I go, hi, heaviness and heaviness goes, oh man, you're going to get it real good today. Oh man. Um, but beyond that, yeah, you know, I, I don't know who that is. No disrespect to him. No disrespect on their family or anything like that. Uh, and, and, uh, and Grant Nadek said, wow, uh, how people threaten you on the internet? Oh man. It's crazy. People threaten us with death and stuff. I mean, it's actually a fairly normal thing. You wouldn't believe it. I mean, people just, for some reason, some people out there act like threatening you with death is just a casual thing. Like, it's not a legitimate death threat. Like, it's crazy to me how people do that. And you have to take them seriously a little bit because, you know, you never know if one of them is going to be legitimate. But for, like, every 1,000 death threats, most of them are just completely hot air. Uh, but it's still kind of crazy. We gotten used to it at this point, so it doesn't really bother me. Um, but it's like... I was honored the first time. Oh, well, yeah, we were actually honored the first time we got a death threat because, like, uh, we got sent an email... And they like actually listed off our home address and everything. And and I was like, wow, I'm honored that someone actually hates us enough and we've gotten big <laughs> enough that they want to kill us. And now we just have I think I I think I actually responded to that email and said, I think I literally said two words, I'm honored, or something like that, and said, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I gotta tell you, it's 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 crazy. But yeah, you know, that's the only time we ever pay attention to anything is whenever we hear about some kind of a death threat being given to us from some other place somewhere. Uh, but honestly, that's kind of died down lately because the specific group that was really going at that strong has apparently imploded on itself. Uh, and so right now, everyone over there is like working on damage control and everything. So we kind of got a break from death threats for about, uh, I think, a week or two weeks now. Uh, so I'm pretty happy with that. It'll start up again, you know, and that is what it is. Uh, and uh, but, but still, it's funny. <laughs> so uh, with that, 
I hope that does address that well, Grant Nadeau, because you asked a good question. I hope I answered that well. Uh, but I, uh, but also, I want to make this very clear. When I bring up that kind of a story, I'm not the one who goes, woe is me, because it's it, it, what it's what comes with the territory. I'm not trying to do a sympathy play with y'all and make y'all feel sorry for us. I mean, most of these people are crazy and they're never going to do anything anyway. So it's just kind of funny. It's a funny story to me. And I don't ever want y'all to go, oh my God, I'm so sorry that you're getting all these death threats. Because, you know, honestly, it doesn't matter. It just is what it is. We'll deal with it in the background. And the show keeps running. Uh, the show never stops. Not for anything. I mean, hell, if, 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 if someone actually tried to break into this house while we were running this show... I have a feeling it would be like that Casey Jones thing, Matthew, from Disney, where like the bandits are climbing on the outside of the train and Casey Jones is beating them off with a shovel and keeping the train running. That's honestly what we'd be doing with the show. We would He's just doing be, what? But you know, beating them with a shovel, you know? Like you remember like oh. that Okay, all well, right. Well that that just became <laughs> awkward out of nowhere. But but anyways. I was just making sure I heard you correctly or something. I thought I heard something else, but never mind. Oh uh, well, no. <laughs> no, you did. You, you heard you heard what you heard. Uh but with that. I hope that does address that well, and it is time for us uh, to move on to the next one. But thank you so much once again for support and helping this channel to keep on running. All right, and the next one is going to go to Marl's World 369. Damn, that's so fun. Hey! They put in a $100 donation, <laughs> and thank you very much for that support. He says, am I a legend now? And uh, Enforcer, is he a legend now? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't, We don't really have like a... Like a, like a hard and fast rule on who becomes a legend. If we see your name a lot in the live chat or a lot in the super chat, you become a legend. Uh, so, and, and honestly, I have not seen your name a lot uh, in, in the live chat. Like I've seen it, I think, like three or four times. So stick around longer and you will absolutely be a legend. But I will say this. Ah, thank you so much for the unbelievable support helping the this channel to keep on running and we will give you a temporary visa for legend status for this week and so with that thank you so much once again i hope that does address that well and thank you so much for helping this channel to keep running if it wasn't for folks like you we wouldn't be able to make this channel possible and i gotta say i'm greatly appreciative of you supporting this channel and just wondering are you a legend am i legend now and you will be legend soon and so with that thank you so much once again and we are on to the next one all right, and our next one is going to go to Lou Habush, uh, who puts in a $50 donation. Hey! And uh, thank you very much, Lou, for that very generous support. Habush. And he said, great job as always, Enforcer and Matt. I've been on since the early days and so happy for your ongoing growth and success. And everyone hit the like button. And thanks much from Lou. And thank you, Lou, very much for those kind words and also your support as well. And Enforcer, what are you saying? And I got to thank you, Lou Habush, for the support and helping this channel to keep on running. The support like yours helps to make this channel possible. And if it wasn't for someone like you helping this channel to keep running, we wouldn't have been able to be here since the early days up until now. I got to thank you so much once again for the massive amount of support and helping this thing to keep on rolling. Because if it wasn't for folks like you, we wouldn't be able to have been here for so long. Uh, and it's crazy to me because we're really one of the few channels that is doing it the original way we we did it at the start. And we're just still trucking along. So many people have started to fall off. And with that, they have started to really uh, change the way they do things. Like, for example, really dropping Ukraine and just becoming a political channel, um, which a lot of them do, which is kind of interesting. Maybe, because it kind of shows that it wasn't never really about Ukraine in the first place. It was really more so about trying to be with what they thought was their thing, you know, like their political thing. Um, but not on this channel. We've been doing this the same way for two years now, over two years, and we're going to keep doing it this way until the war ends. Uh, and so with that, thank you so much once again for support. Thank you so much for enjoying this channel, and thank you for helping it to be possible. And so with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Herberg, who throws in a $20 donation. And thank you very much for your support as well, Herberg. They said, thank you for your work, guys. And the quality on your shows have really been amazing lately. And so sorry for law school. I'm certainly not. I'm, I'm telling not. you. It <laughs> says greetings from LSA Norway and Slav Ukraine. Hey, thank you so much, Herberg, for the support and helping this channel to keep on running. And uh, why are you sorry for law school? We're not sorry. Why are you sorry? <laughs> like, like, why Man, would you I'm be sorry? I'm not sorry for law school, but uh, law school is sorry. I'm telling you what. I'm telling you that it was sorry. Uh, and I think they're starting to finally get. In, they're getting close to rounding out the semester by this point. I think. Uh, but. I wouldn't have survived that long. I'm telling y'all what. <laughs> I would have been like freaking 
I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't even be here right now. I would have been completely shattered. I would have ended doing this. I would have been sitting in a corner crying, and I would have dropped out of law school anyways eventually because I absolutely hated it. Every single second of it. No disrespect uh, to any of the professors except for one um, that absolutely sucked at their job, and they know who they are because I'm sure they're probably already getting fired by this point. Um, but beyond that, the professors were all right. Shade at him real quick. Yeah, I mean, I mean, dude, you heard the horror stories about that professor. Every section in the law school heard horror stories about that one professor. Remember, it was the one covering the uh, certain topic that sounds like pop tart. Oh, oh, oh! Uh, well, I, I guess that didn't click. <laughs> I was like waiting for you to say something more. I was like, okay, I guess, I guess that uh, oh, that went. Are we back? Oh, oh, oh my God. Are, are we gone? Or what, what's happening? Where are we? What? Man, you went dead silent for a minute. You back? Oh, uh, I'm back. I, I've, I've never left. Oh, good. Never what were you left. saying? Like, what was the last thing you said about law school? Um, you know, you know, that one professor, Matthew, the one, uh, that, that had something to do with pop, uh, pop tarts. Oh yeah. Yeah. I remember that one. Yeah. in my section that didn't even make the time to make a PowerPoint or cover anything for that matter. And then got pissed off when students started pointing out that whatever the hell the professor was saying was contradictory and wasn't even in the book. Uh, that one, that one. Um, yeah, I, I remember that one. That I'm not gonna lie. I'm, I'm I'm not gonna lie. Oh, go ahead. What were you gonna say? No, no, no. Go ahead. Not lie. Go ahead, please. I was gonna say that I really don't have honestly. Like there was maybe one or two professors in there that I would say were were good and they seemed like they had a uh, good attitude and stuff like that. But I'll be straight up honest. Not too many good things to say about most of the professors I had. And I can't say the same about college. I actually had really good professors in college in the political science uh, uh, major. But I can't say the same about law school. I don't know what the deal was. They had a lot of, a lot of arrogance behind them. It was sort of hard to look, uh, look past that. Yeah. Well, you know what? i got to be honest with you. Yeah, when you, when you include that, you know, like, do I care that the professor was, like, first in their class? No. Because if you were first in your class, why are you back here teaching at law school? I mean, you know, like, it's like you should have gone on to do better things. Why are you back here? But, you know, that, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, like, uh, some of them were nice people. But I got to admit, the arrogant side of things was tough to deal with. Because in person, I try, like, I I'm not an arrogant person. And honestly, arrogance really really makes me sick to my stomach to see people being arrogant. And that's one thing that I really liked about undergrad is that none of the professors were arrogant. They were very nice people. Uh, and they were just great folks because we went to UAB and all the professors that I had were really good, save for a few, like literally just a tiny amount of them. Uh, and then you go to law school and while some of them seemed like all right people, a lot of them seemed like they had like this complex going where they had to act like they were better than, than thou. And, you know, I, I don't really like that. Um, and you know, that was, eh, you know, that was something that I, I, I could honestly do without, uh, that's, that's one thing that made uh, law school also feel so stuffy is that it felt like everyone was trying to play some stupid little piddly Italy power game with each other, where they tried to make each other seem a little bit better than the other, even amongst the students. Uh, and that was one thing that I was like, that is kind of stupid. Um, you know, just to me, uh, because you would hear it, like, you would hear like someone like boastfully say, I was a paralegal. And it's like, you just like got coffees and like move papers around. Like anyone can do that. You know, it's like not really. That. I was actually a paralegal for a while for six months. I was an intern paralegal, Ooh. Uh, Ooh. a real one, <laughs> like a, a, a real one, man, a real one, not just one running the coffee. And like, uh, I'll be honest. I was like the first moment I realized, I don't think I really want to do this, <laughs> but I went on anyway. I plunged on. So I'm like, I'm not going to stop. Uh, and I went all the way to the end. I was like, yep, I, I confirm it after law school. I'm like, this is not for me. And I was out. Yeah, and yeah, uh, I just I, I'm telling you, I'm uh, Herbert. You brought up bad memories, so we're like going down bad memory lane. Um, but I just I just did not like it, and uh, I'm happy that I left. I'm happy. I think we're both happy that we left. And once I started doing this, I knew that this was really my passion, and that's why it was so tough uh, for me to even try and go to law school in the first place or even think about ending this to keep doing that because I just enjoy doing this so much more. I was like, am I going to really stop doing something I actually love doing to do something I don't really like? Uh, and that was a really, really tough one. Uh, and also, SK, yes, the war is still on, but we're in the question segment, so you take your time. Um, but moving on from that and getting back into the Super Chat, um, I, uh, I do thank you, though, for enjoying our massive... Uh, like boost in the like the quality of the show because it's it's been going on the up and up. I feel like we're a lot more energetic, a lot more happy, and our jokes are sticking a lot better now because we actually have the mental power uh, because we get enough sleep 
uh, to be able to come up with jokes and actually make the show good and also work on other things on, on the channel that are also much better. Like the way the merch store is run now, I mean, amazing. I've, of course, the flags have not gotten out yet. They will be getting out by April 22nd. Um, but, I mean, it, it's truly incredible how this channel is working right now. It's blowing up. It's doing great. Uh, and I'm very happy to see it. And I got to thank you so much for the support and helping this channel to keep on running, Herberg. Because if it wasn't for folks like you, we wouldn't be able to have made that decision where we decided not to go to law school and instead do this full time. Uh, and, and so with that, thank you so much once again. Hello to all of our LSA viewers up in Norway, uh, including you, Herberg, Siri. Uh, let's see, I think Marius Holton. Um Zyper Sniper, so many of y'all. There are a load of y'all from Norway, and I gotta say hello to each one of you, and hello to you, Herberg, and I hope y'all are having a great day today. And so with that, thank you so much once again, and we are on to the next one. And our next one goes to Carrie Ann Corzo, who puts in a $20 donation and says, hey! Hi guys, doing great as always, and Nick wants to know if there are any Central American countries throwing their support to Russia or Ukraine. There's not really many. Um, Brazil kind of leans a little bit towards Russia, but not really enough to actually do anything for the Russians. And there's really no one else. Really, all of South America never gets involved in uh, in external affairs. So they're all kind of doing their own thing. And also, Ecuador ended up getting into, uh, the, uh, turned into the Thunderdome a couple of months ago. So I think they're still focusing on the Thunderdome that's happening in there. And I don't think they're going to be quitting anytime soon because the capital is called Quito. So I have a feeling that they're not going to be quitting. So... Uh, also, I want to look at this capital city. What does it look like? I'm interested. What does it look like, Matthew? What does it look like? What is is called Juan de Guha. Juan de Guha, probably something like that. But not not that bad. Where's this at again? This what is in the capital, is... Quito. Quito. Quito, where? In uh, Ecuador. Ecuador. You know. Zoom out on the map like I'm having a brain fart here. Where's Ecuador now? Uh, right there. Oh, dear. Like, I was thinking this was on the other side of South America or something. I'm glad you zoomed out. <laughs> yeah, this is up near Colombia and Peru. Oh, Colombia. They make good jackets there. Also, really good blow. Arr, give me some of that fine <laughs> Peruvian blow. <laughs> Speaking of Peru, there's Peru. Uh, where the hell? You know, I've always wondered. I've never looked at this on a map for some reason. Where is Machu Picchu in Peru? So it's right there. That's actually a lot more south than I thought it would be. And, like, is there even a city nearby to this place? Okay, so there is, actually. There's just a city, like, right down there. Isn't that kind of stupid that no one found this until, like, 1920, considering it was just right up here? That is weird. It's like no one wandered up here at some point and was like, oh, look at all these rocks. Maybe I ought to start clearing it out. No, no one did that until like the 1920s. And then someone went up there and was like, oh, look at all these rocks. I ought to clear it out. It's like, why did no one do that also, before? They charge, they charge uh, 25 bucks to go up here. It's got 76,000 reviews with a very high rating. That's crazy. That's like the most Google reviews I've seen on anything. Well, it's really pretty up here too. Look at it. I mean, it's really nice. That is beautiful. I like that. Yeah, it's not like all nice and humid as hell. <laughs> but beyond that, it's really pretty. Um, I mean, that's that's something, man. Like, you know what it looks like? It looks like the Alps, but uh, tropical. Somewhat, somewhat. I think I might have flown a flight simulator mission through here as well at some point. Man, everything for you goes back to GTA and flight simulator, man. Like, everything. Yeah. You'll be like, man, that's <laughs> yeah. a buzzer for real. But beyond that. I do thank you so much for the support and helping this channel to keep on running. I hope we were able to address the uh, the, the question fairly well, or at least the statement fairly well, uh, because I don't think anyone in South America is supporting the Russians or supporting the West in any big way. I think they're all kind of just doing their own thing. Um, but with that, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And with that, we are on to the next one. In our next Super Chat is going to go to Cody Hell, who puts in a $20 donation. And thank you very much, Cody, for that support. He says, do you think uh, that Russia is involved in the recent events in Serbia? Question mark. Uh, no. Uh, I think, well, the Serbian, the Serbian thing has been going on for a while. It's been going on forever. It's what started World War I, which is really the catalyst for everything that the modern world works off of. Uh, and it's been going on ever since, even during Yugoslav times and then after Yugoslavia. So the Russians aren't really 
messing with Serbian Kosovan affairs. It's more so just something that keeps on going because it fuels itself. And then everyone in the world kind of gets involved in their way, trying to alter the course of events and how they turn out down there. Uh, the Russians support the Serbs all the way, though. And the Serbs love Russia. It's a really weird relationship. Uh, and then the Western world supports Kosovo, not because like we like the Kosovans or anything. It's just that we don't like genocide and the Serbs genocide the Kosovans, or as what they call it, ethnic cleanse the Kosovans. So we stop them from doing that. And that's why Kosovo even exists in the first place. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that fairly well. And thank you so much once again for the support and helping this channel to keep on running. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one is going to go to John Bartley. He throws in a $20 donation while I stugna a body who said, you are uh, clueless. Uh, well, I guess what? He's uh, not voiceless. But uh, John Bartley put in that 20 and said, as Americans, we yearn to help Ukraine. And it's extremely sad. We all see it. And my question is, how do we keep Americans engaged in this war when we continue the daily grind of providing for our friends and families? Great question, John. And an incredible question. Uh, and it's one that's quite deep. Uh, it's, it's one that can't really easily be answered. Um, because everyone is always involved in the daily struggle of providing for friends and families. Uh, the citizen, uh, for the most part, focuses on that as their priority. Everything else kind of comes secondary. So domestic concerns always take priority. Um, it's a really tough thing to answer as well without me getting into... Um, politics is the best way to explain it because it's a... It's a very tough thing to explain, and it really just depends on how you want to fix the problem. Uh, I believe the best thing, and this is my honest opinion, is for the government to support Ukraine. Um, a lot of people in the United States uh, try and make it their primary concern, like it's the citizenry's job to support Ukraine with their own money. Uh, and it really isn't, because the amount that the citizenry can raise is minuscule to the amount that Ukraine actually needs. Take this channel, for instance. We have raised $1.3 million for nonprofits over two years. And that sounds big until you realize that over just one year, the United States provided $80 billion of federal funding to Ukraine to keep them running in this war. Then that $1.3 million becomes a drop in the bucket. And while we're doing a lot as a channel to help out Ukraine, in the big picture, it's not really a lot. And that's the problem that I see constantly uh, with people who are into the war. They act like this is the primary way, like the way this channel runs, like the way we do Sunday fundraisers. They act like that is the primary way to help out Ukraine. And I'm here to say that it isn't. Like, I do, I'm, I'm one of the people who runs fundraisers like that, that do help out nonprofits in Ukraine. And the reality is, is that the amount of support that the American citizenry alone can end up raising for support in Ukraine is so minuscule, it doesn't really do much. It's really something that has to be done by a national government, like the U.S. government, providing billions of dollars in a single package to help them out. And that's why I think it's much more important for the citizenry instead of trying to support Ukraine out of their own pocket instead of their friends and family. I think, uh, well, yeah, their friends and family. I think it's much more important for the citizenry to focus their efforts on a democratic level and to actually try and get uh, the government to support Ukraine. Uh, because that's kind of where everything's being held up right now. And if you notice, the, the citizenry of the United States is supporting Ukraine as much as as it is now, as it was at the beginning of the war, or as much as it actually can. And without that federal support in the billions of dollars per month, or tens of billions per year, there's just not really a lot that can actually be done for Ukraine. Uh, and, and that's something, that that's also why I don't really put that much emphasis, and I want to say this though, the support that we raise on our Sunday fundraisers is profound. It's huge, and it helps out a lot of people in Ukraine. But at the same time, I don't want to pressure y'all to put y'all selves in a, hard, in a rock in a hard place to support those fundraisers. Because in reality, while it's doing a good amount of help, it's not doing the help that is going to turn the war around entirely on its own. So I don't want y'all to feel like y'all have the weight of the world on y'all's shoulders when we run those fundraisers. Because y'all don't. The, the weight of the world isn't on y'all's shoulders. It's on the U.S. government's shoulders. And that's why I think it's very important that the citizenry pushes uh, on the fence uh, representatives and senators or anti-Ukrainian representatives and senators to support Ukraine. I'm not saying by threatening them. I'm not saying by calling them evil people. I'm saying 
argue on their level, you know, like, you know, talk about things that they would care about, the arguments where they say it's not in America's interest, explain why it is in America's interest. When they say it's a money pit, explain why it's not a money pit. Um, when they say the Russians are our friends, explain why the Russians aren't our friends. You know, argue things that would make sense to them. Argue to them something that they'd like to hear. Sell them what they want to buy is what I'm trying to say. And that's something that I don't see a lot of people doing. In fact, we're actually going down the opposite route. Because while this channel continues to try and unify everyone, regardless of their political standing around the world on Ukraine, many Ukrainian channels have taken the opposite stance and decided that only one side of, of the political spectrum is the right, true, and righteous side, and the other side is filled with demons. And even if they want to support Ukraine, we ought to force them to where they cannot support Ukraine, or they ought to be canceled for attempting to. And that is something that is absolutely devastating to any kind of a movement, any kind of a cause. So, and then, you know, work from there. Uh, and also, I got to say this. Uh, oh, wait a minute. The stream has flatlined. We had some big lag, man. Big I was lag. over here hearing Robot Andrew going on. Man, I'm telling you what. We're going to wait for the lag to pass. Hopefully it passes soon. And I think it's over. I'm hearing you pretty clear now. I think it might be over. Uh, but with that, um, I hope that does address that the best I can. Um, hopefully y'all heard that. Uh, but still, with that, uh, I thank you so much once again for support and helping this channel to keep on running. Because folks like you do help to make this thing possible. Uh, and, uh, and so with that, thank you so much once again for helping this channel to keep on running. Uh, and thank you for helping this uh, channel to be possible. And uh, let's see here. And I see um, really quickly... It looks like something was going on in the live chat. Uh, really quickly to address that. Uh, I don't know why uh, you're, you're so particularly angry. Because once again, I'm trying to quote everything off the top of our head. So if we get something wrong, you can correct us. And we're more than happy to be corrected. But there's no reason to get extremely angry about it. Or be passive aggressive about it. Uh, I, I, don't, I personally don't like passive aggressiveness. I try not to be passive aggressive with y'all. Uh, so if we got something wrong, sorry about that. And if you want to point that out, that's fine. Um, but to get angry about that, that's, a, that's another thing. You're starting to cross a line there, uh, and it's a line that is something that there's a point of no return there. Uh, and so with that, I hope that, I hope that addresses that well. Uh, and I hope that the person who I'm talking to knows I'm talking to them because I'm not wanting to call you out by name, but I'm seeing what's going on. And I'm not really a big fan of that. That seems a little rude. Uh, but with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and our next super chat is going to go to S. Langston. Uh, he puts in a twenty dollar donation and said, "Instead of vote for Pedro, it's a vote for the enforcer." And don't forget to get your stuff from Lake City. And thank you so much for the support and helping this channel to keep on running. Uh, and it's it's a it, and I gotta say, Lake City is the place to get it. Uh, and also, uh, let's see. And also, thank you so much for wanting to vote for me. I hope that I'm able to win the presidential election in 2040. And also, Lake City Army Ammunition Plant is the best place to get ammunition from. It's high-spec ammunition. Uh, the the Millsurp 30-06 that you can get that was made at Lake City is the best. The best, Jerry, the best. And I will swear by Lake City until I die. And so with that, thank you so much once again for the support, S. Langston, and helping this channel to keep on running. Because folks like you help to make it possible. And so, with that... Thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And with that, we are on to the next one. And our next one goes to Madame EXE. Uh, sounds like a Windows file, but they put in a $10 <laughs> donation. And seriously, though, all jokes aside, thank you very much for that support. And they said, thank you for all you do. And I appreciate clean information and your channel fits the definition. Uh, and, and thank you so much for that. And thank you for enjoying the channel. We try and make it as clean and as straightforward as possible uh, because it's it, it's some, it, like news coverage is something that some people don't do too well. I try and make sure that we make it a coherent story every day. Uh, and I hope that we make that possible. Like, let, like I am open to criticism on that. Like, if, if it seems like a story is not that clear, say so. Because I'll make sure to circle back and try and make it a little bit more clear if I can in my words. But I always try and make the news each night like a big story coming together. Uh, and I hope that I was able to do that tonight because uh, because it it is something that we try to do. Is I get rid of a bot that is apparently trying to call us a certain political affiliation. I have none of that around here. Excuse you. Um, but still, 
thank you so much once again. And thank you for the kind words. And thank you for supporting this channel and helping us to keep this thing running. And also, John Barley, I want to clarify. No, that was that statement was not directed to you. Your question was incredible. Uh, and I got to thank you for helping the channel to keep on running. That was not directed at you at all. And I see that it looks like it's still going on. Uh, and I got to say, I was, I was saying, don't be rude. And you responded back by being rude. So I'm going to say this one more time. Um, because you, you've been around for quite a while and, and we're always happy to have you here, but I don't, I don't act rude to you and I don't expect you to act rude to anyone here, Matthew or me. Uh, don't mean to say this on air because I don't really like to get on to this kind of stuff, but, the, but I've seen how the interaction has been going and it seems to be fairly, it started off fairly rude on a one sided kind of a way. So I hope that you, I hope that you you know, back off and I hope, I hope things get back to normal down there. Uh, because uh, you know, there'd be, you know, we, tr we try and keep things respectful around here. If you see what I'm saying, but with that, we are on to the next one. All right. And also John Bartley, I want to make it clear. We weren't talking about you. You said it wasn't me. Was it? No, it was not you, no, John. No. Don't worry. We were not talking about you at all. I see where you might misunderstand what we were saying with that. So no, but thank you very much for the support, John. And no, we were not referring to you. So you're all good. Uh, but anyways, moving on to our next one here, we have a $10 donation from Andy L and he did not leave a comment, but Andy L also told us to check the PO box and we shall. Hey! Um, honestly, I haven't been by there in a good minute. Uh, I need to go back by. So we will check it and thank you very much for that support and enforcer what say you and i gotta thank you so much for the support andy l and i gotta thank you for helping the channel keep on running we will make sure to go check out the p.o box and go see what's inside all the neat goodies and gifts because we always love to get gifts and presents we love to see them they were they're always really cool and usually they tell a story from our viewers like you andy l and i hope that is a really cool one and so with that Thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that quite well, quite well indeed. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and our next one goes to Warfighters, who throws in their first ever super chat of the stream. And hey! thank you very much for your support, by the way. They said, I really appreciate all you do. And Smokey Bear says it's okay you call him Smokey the Bear, LOL. Hey! Is it really Smokey Bear? I could have sworn it was Smokey the Bear. One second, Smokey. Hang on, let me put this in. Smoke. Okay, so I'm I'm getting a search result for Smokey the Bear, but it's uh, wait a minute, hang on, it's actually Smokey Bear. It's not Smokey the Bear. It's Smokey Bear. They have an entire website about Smokey Bear. Like, I'm not even kidding. Let's see it. Huh. I wonder if this. Wait, stuff man, is I can, actually, I can see. I'm just not looking at the stream thing. Hold on, let me try <laughs> oh, to click over to it. <laughs> let's see it. And <laughs> it's literally on screen. It's like um, I let them have it. Let's see. Let's, oh yeah, yeah. I see it now. There we go. Man, that Smokey's looking like more futuristic every day. That thing looks like it's AI generated now. I think that one is. It could be. It looks too For decades, hyper realistic. I've taught you everything. All right, we're gonna mute it there. Man, why does Smokey <laughs> sound like a millennial? Man, why does why does he sound like he's like trying to seduce you? For decades, we've been out here. Smokey's been here for decades. <laughs> yeah, it's like I don't know about this. <laughs> like I, I don't know about this, my boy. Uh, but. Thank you so much, Warfighters, for correcting us on that. Uh, for my entire life, I've always heard it called Smokey the Bear, not Smokey Bear. Like, it's always, like, my entire, I cannot even tell you, my grandmother called Smokey Bear, Smokey the Bear. Like, uh, that's just the thing in our family. We've never called Smokey the Bear, Smokey Bear. But it's actually Smokey Bear. That's actually the correct technical name. Uh, and so with that, thank you so much once again for helping this channel to keep on running. Because folks like you help to make it possible. And so... Thank you so much once again for throwing in your first super chat ever. Apparently that was apparently that error was uh, was egregious enough that you're like I have to support these people to let them know they're wrong. <laughs> and you're right, we we're actually wrong. Uh, but still, thank you so much once again, and we will make sure to correct that going here forward. And so, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And we are on to the next one. All right, and our next super chat is going to go to Rangers Rule, who throws in a ten dollar donation. And thank you very hey! much, good sir, for that support as well. He said, you both rock and happy the way things are turning out for you. And LSA lives on. 2040. And the LSA does live on. I look forward to seeing all of y'all in 2040. And I got to say that I'm happy to hear that you're happy for us. Uh, we try our best to run this channel each and every day. And I'm always so happy uh, to know that folks are happy about the, ch the direction this channel is heading in. We try our best to make this as 
good a channel as possible, um, you know, to make it as fun, as entertaining, as interesting, and also as tame as possible. Because many of y'all, I've seen many people who I actually have not seen the names of before saying, wow, this live chat is so tame. We work really hard to cultivate the most tame live chat on the internet. Like, we, we really do. There are many people who are banned out of here every single night because we, we try and make sure that this is as pleasant a thing as possible. It is a war, and it is on the internet, but that doesn't mean that it has to be a pit of actual, uh, of absolute depravity and savagery. Uh, and, and we make sure to keep it like that. Uh, so I have to give a massive credit to Enforcer Matt on that end because he's the one who really moderates the chat and make sure to keep it all smooth and well running. And it's an incredible community because of that. Um, and I got to say that it's an incredible community because of all the folks we've been able to have here, like that are here right now. Absolutely incredible. And I got to thank you so much once again for the support and helping this channel keep on running. And I'm so glad to hear that you see it going on the up and up and you, th and, and you believe the things in the background are on the up and up because we try our best to keep things that way, to keep them going well. And so with that, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And with that, we're on to the next one. All right. And our next one is going to go to Michael Sanborn, who puts in a $10 donation. Uh, and thank you very much, Michael. He hey. says, uh, do you think that the United States has secretly given the green light to hit Russian oil? Uh, no, because they actually publicly came out today and they said that they were not. And we are also seeing that the attacks on oil refineries are starting to significantly decrease. In fact, we haven't seen one for the past few days. Uh, so with that, I hope that does address that well, at least in my opinion. Uh, and thank you so much once again for helping this channel to keep on running. Uh, and I also saw um, something interesting in the chat. It's like, well, that's kind of why we do Super Chats. <laughs> it's like you can kind of... Add it all together. But anyways, with that, we're on to That the was next a goon, one. man. Yeah, that, that was, was one a, of those that was hot a, dog goons. That was, that was a goon, but it's so stupid because like they list the number like we're keeping it secret. It's like you can literally see the super chats at the top of the live chat. It's not like we're trying to keep anything secret. It's pretty transparent. Um, but anyways, they've, they've foiled us again, folks. They they actually told you all that there are super chats that are up there on top of the live chat. Oh, my God. Terrible. But anyways, with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and the next one goes to John Bartley once again. He throws in a $10 donation. And once again, a big thanks to you, John, for that support. He says, Enforcer, you shoulders. Uh, you should, I think I'm going to say, you should teach war history. <laughs> and you wouldn't make great money, but damn, uh, you can teach. And you make it fun for young people. And I can only imagine your t uh, test questions like AR versus AK. <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> John. Oh, yeah, that would actually be a question I put on a test. It would be like one of those open-ended essay questions at the end of the test, like uh, like question forty-nine. What is the difference in between the AK and the AR platforms, and why do you believe the AK or AR platform is uh, superior? Explain in two paragraphs minimum. That would be like an actual like test question I would ask. Uh, and, and I think, I think that would be really cool. I would I would want to be a professor or something like that. But the thing is, I feel like we kind of do that here on this channel, um, to a good bit for people who care, because the sad thing is, is that in high school, some, some folks just don't care and I get it, you know, because the school forces people to try and be interested in things that they're not interested in, uh, in, and so, you know, a lot of kids just go into classes that they hate and they don't want to be there in, uh, so I get that. Uh, but college level, being a professor would be pretty cool. Uh, but sadly, a lot of colleges don't like to do military history. Uh, they like to do civil history, which is interesting and all. Like, not dissing civil history, because it's a very important part of history. It's really the history. Uh, but at the same time, military history is just so interesting. And, you know, there's so much to learn from. There's so many developments and technological leaps uh, that, um, you know, that, that, that happen. And so with that... Um, I hope that does address that well. Um, and so with that, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that the best I can. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right. And the next one goes to Uncovered Cube, who puts in a five. And uh, he gives us an address here. He says, uh, let's see, let me make sure. He said, we're near a random. Let me let me check this one real quick. Let me put it in the Google. Um, let's see. Google Maps. Google Maps, Bliat. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, let's, let's to be safe. Um, Uncovered Cube says 230 Pisgah Pike, Versailles, Kentucky. Uh, we're near a random castle, which is pretty cool. And LSA. 
Can you can you like can you spell that Pisca for that that thing for me real quick? <laughs> it's a uh, P I S uh, uh, G A H Pike. We got it, baby. <laughs> we got it. All right. So where is this even? This is outside of Lexington, Kentucky. So way up Lexington. There. Lexington and Concord, <laughs> but beyond that, look, it's Versailles, Matthew. Man, Versailles, man, I'm gonna there's get... a palace, yeah, there's like a castle, Kroger. the Kentucky Castle. Let's take a look at this. Oh, it's got good ratings, dude. That wow. looks like a Mr. Beast, man. Right that now. gold gate, I'm telling you what, the gates are gold. Come on in, <laughs> we got the best steaks. Look at that blackberry. Oh, you just cut out. Cocktail, did you see that? Oh, God. Oh. Let's see here. Oh. Oh. Huh? Are we back? Oh, we're back. Kentucky. We're back. Oh, here's the... Oh. <laughs> oh. Is that a chessboard? That's the that's the hotel. Whoa, this is a rendering. Um, Can we just get a What's normal picture doing? of this place? Okay, so here it is. Here's the normal picture of this place. That looks like Fort Knox, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it just sounds like, like a castle. It looks like Fort Knox to me. It looks like uh, man, I'm not gonna lie. Like this is like a something I really can't process if I like it or not. It looks kind of good, but kind of horrific at the same time. I'm not sure what to think. I'm not sure what to think of this either, at all. They have horses. They have little horses. They have some interesting food. It's a wedding venue. Interesting. You know what? I want to go look at the local town of Lexington because I'm interested now. What's in Lexington? So we see the suburbs. Nice. Uh, but what's in the actual Nostalgia Station Toy Museum? What is this? I dig it. Oh, <laughs> so basically, I, I like dig this. it. Um, this this is cool. This is pretty cool. Um, oh, look at that. They, they have... used to have a place. Uh, they used to have a place down in uh, Biloxi, Mississippi, that looked like a lot like this. They sold like Lionel model trains and stuff. I think they might be out of business, but it was somewhat like this. Oh man, sad dude. The, the story is sadder than that. The old guy who ran the store passed away. Uh, so his, you know, his estate sold off the building and everything inside of it. Uh, and then it ended up becoming one of those stupid artisan coffee shops that flopped, and now the building's been abandoned oh. for years. So. Uh, that sucks. Yeah, unfortunate. Like, don't open. Like, it was literally in a little building like that because it used to be the old train station down there in this town. But that is really cool. It's like a trip down memory lane because that was a really, really cool building that 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 fella had. You don't see things like that anymore um, often because the folks who run places like that are dying, uh, and you know, no one wants to carry that kind of stuff on. But still, really cool. Uh, but let's go look at the actual town here that's nearby because I'm actually more interested in the town than the castle. So, what does this look like? Oh, dude, this is nice. Wow, this is really nice. Yeah, it's pretty clean. Yeah, the streets are well kept up. I'm telling y'all, I'm a sucker for well-kept streets. And these streets are really well kept up. Oh, my Lord, this is a really nice little town. Look at this. It's just beautiful. Oh, they got unions. They got the union. Oh, damn. They got the Teamsters up in here. <laughs> you know <what> I'm <laughs> Man, they about start that spark. That's <laughs> at the community cafe. Uh. What else? What other kind of cafe is there? Like the non-communal cafe? Like I don't know. But there's the private cafe. I guess I've never heard of one of those. I've always heard of like them being community kind of things. But what do we have here? We got the air gallery. I don't know what the hell a gallery is. Gallery. Oh wait, did it say? Oh sorry. Oops. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I thought you said gallery, man. I was like, what the hell's a gallery? Like I've never heard of that before. Let's go look at this street. Get right in the intersection so we can look down all sides. Here we go. Man, these loading times are horrific on Google Maps today. I know. Gee, like yesterday it was quick. Today it's slow as Christmas. But let's see here. Nice church. I like the church. Uh, this looks like it used to be the old city courthouse probably because we had one like that back where we used to live. And uh, let's see. There's a real estate company. Uh, this is a pharmacy actually. A compounding laboratory. Oh, compounding pharmacists. I, I actually uh, learned a lot about that on YouTube video like uh, about a week ago. I can't remember most of it, but it was pretty interesting. Huh, interesting. I wish we knew more about what you learned <laughs> because you did tell yeah, I can't remember myself. <laughs> like, there's, a, there's a compounding pharmacist and then there's like a normal one uh, to my understanding. And the compounding one actually is like a chemist. Huh, so maybe that's what, that, maybe that's what the different was, difference was in Britain, why they called them chemists. 
and uh, pharmacists, maybe, or there was just a different. Yeah, regular. they can. They can whip up uh, your own custom batch of drugs. Man, that kind of sounds Gucci. <laughs> like you want your own <laughs> drugs, homie. Like here, have some. What is what is the Aviation Museum of Kentucky? Do they have anything cool here? Oh, oh, oh. Whoa, Whoa, Jack. Whoa, Jack! Oh, they got a they got an A four from the Blue Angels. Cool. Everyone has a Blue Angels plane. Like you have to have one. Uh, and then they have an AH one F. Really cool. <laughs> and then they have this F fourteen. I'm assuming it looks like an F fourteen. I might be wrong. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Oh they got no! Got eagle in a box. That is a felony right there. <laughs> yeah, it's a legit felony <laughs> to have a dead eagle. So um, interesting that this museum has one. Uh, we also have <laughs> a F five Tiger Shark, uh, the trainer version. I think this is like the T thirty eight Talon and Thunderbirds livery. A PT seventeen Steerman. These are really cool. Um, an F four Phantom. Really cool. Um, the thingamajig. Uh, they also have the eagle or or wings in a row. Man, they are going to get that felony on the camera. <laughs> look how they're recording it. Like, look at this. Man, they're like, yo, look, it's a felony. <laughs> That's a cops. Come and get them. Uh, oh, they got a it Kiwa. It must be like a fake or something. Dude, they got a Kiwa. I like that. That one's a little beat up, quinoa. though. Not quinoa. It's a Kiwa. <laughs> it's not no damn uh, quinoa, man. <laughs> get the hell out of here. That, that shit's nasty. Uh, but let's see here. Uh, let's see. H1F. I like it. Uh, that is that is an F fourteen F fourteen C uh, maybe D I don't know um, but man they keep on taking pictures of that dang eagle I mean like they love that eagle they're like it's a felony and we're proud of it uh, but let's see here man it's probably not a felony though it's probably like a fake one or something no nah, that's a taxidermy eagle right there man you can tell like the... <laughs> I mean I'm trying to give them the benefit of the doubt <laughs> man they stuffed and feathered that thing, you know what I mean like they were they were proud of that thing they're like we've committed a felony and we're proud of it uh they got some jet engines on display overall not a bad museum as far as local museums go is that an aim 54 it is it's a phoenix that's really cool uh like a, just a whole aim 54 phoenix up here in this museum um so nice uh, in case y'all are wondering why I keep calling the eagle a felony, in the United States, it's a felony to kill. E-I-O-U. E ah. <laughs> but it was... Anyways. Thanks y'all for bearing with us with this lag. This is horrendous. It's like a like a geomagnetic storm has hit the towers or something. Um, uh, well, the cell towers. <laughs> it's, 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 it's like a geomagnetic storm hit the towers. Yeah, it well, came out bad, towers. actually. <laughs> Mr. President, the second geomagnetic <laughs> storm is in the towers. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> anyway, it's... <laughs> I didn't even oh, catch Lord. on. I didn't that even was catch a on bushism. That. I didn't even ha catch on to how that could have been taken until you corrected yourself. <laughs> and then I was like, oh no. I was like, no. I was like, now we're getting canceled. Uh, but, anyways, uh, Lexington doesn't look that bad. What is the Rupp Arena? Man, they're getting rupped up in there. You know what I mean? And then you got the Mary Todd Lincoln House right there. Wow, cool. Right by the Rupp Arena. You get a little bit Rupp. of Rupp and the Mary Todd. You know what I mean? Uh, but let's see here. Rupp Row. Thoroughbred Park. Thorough, oh. Wait a minute, say it again. Thoroughbred Park. Oh, yeah, because Lexington, Kentucky oh, is, where, is where the Derby is held. You know, the little horse race thing. This is where it's held, isn't it? Like, right over here. That's yeah, the big horse race, actually. It's not the little one. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, you get the picture. You get the picture. Uh, but beyond that, that's pretty cool. And thank you so much. I didn't much. get a picture. Where, where is it? Oh man, I'm telling you, I didn't know <laughs> I try and make a figure of speech, and he tells me that it's liberal. Oh man, I'm telling you. Oh man, when I was growing up, my parents hated me. Oh man, they'd always give Matthew all the good toys. Oh man, only thing they gave me was a toaster and a radio to put in the bathtub. Oh man, I'm telling you. Uh, but anyways, with that, I thank you so much for the support. I hope you enjoyed toaster and a radio in the bathtub. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, that sounds that's dangerous. Yeah, that's the point, Matthew. That's the point. Uh, but anyways, thank, <laughs> thank you so much for the support and helping this channel to keep on running. You, you're making it possible for us to be stupid on air. Like, you're making it possible for me to sound like an absolute idiot on air. And so with that, thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And maybe one day we'll be able to go up to Lexington, Matthew. I think that'd be kind of cool. That would be pretty neat. Lexington. Something big happened there, I remember. You're thinking of Lexington, Lexington and Massachusetts. Lexington, the Concord. Yeah. You're thinking of Lexington up here in, like, Boston. 
It's like in Boston now. Like uh, I don't know why I said it like I was Boston. There it is up top. It's up. It's north. Uh, northwest. Oh, here we go. Lexington. I think Concord yeah, right is a little bit further out. They made these look so much closer uh, in Fallout Four. There it is. There's Concord right there. And then there's I, uh, isn't that where Paul Revere came running through? Man, that's where he went running through, and he said, "Whoa, them red ass bitches <laughs> be coming around the corner." And then they're oh. like, "Oh, damn!" But, but you know, anyways. Man, Paul Revere was the most revered snitch of all time. So he was he was snitching <laughs> for the right people. Man, he was. Man, he was. He came there. through like <laughs> he came through like Takashi Six Nine ran through here to my. The, <laughs> the, 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 the British are coming. The, the British are coming. Bro, he t- he gave him the numbers and everything. He's like, the British are coming. There's like nine hundred of them, and they got drummers, and they got everything. <laughs> Quick, get them all out out here. But also, like, look at how short of a distance that really is. I mean, that's just a short drive from where Boston really was at the time, which was this little spot right here. Like, it, he he went from there in Boston straight up to Lexington, and then you know, over to Concord. And that was considered, like, a record-breaking feat. Like, if you look at that, that wasn't that long of a trip. I mean, you know, it wasn't horseback and everything, which makes it a long trip. But when you put it into the modern picture, uh, how big that is, I mean, it's not that big of a trip. It's really not that not, not, not that far, but maybe if you're on a horse or something, it might be rough. Yeah, and I like how they built a whole entire airfield right outside of Concord, you know? Yeah, it definitely wasn't back in Paul Revere's time. Hey, look, there's Minuteman High School right there. Uh, where, where, you saw where? that Minuteman Visitor Center right there below the uh, Air Force Base to the right. Oh. Minuteman High School. What is this? It, it, wait a minute. M1 Lincoln Laboratory. What the hell is that? Do you see that? MIT? No, no, go down. There's something Lincoln Laboratory down there? Yeah, MIT it's like Lincoln below the high school. Laboratory. Hey, click on that. It's a, it's a, huh. M, it's a, it's do. what, what does it do? Like, what is this? It's a research laboratory for the, uh, for the Massachusetts in- Institute of Technology. What are they laboratory in though? What are they doing? You know what they do in laboratories, science stuff, man. They're like what they doing in there, man. They're turning pig people into people, man. <laughs> right for your freaking life. But Man, I'm just trying to see if it's that Wuhan or something. Oh, look. Paul Revere was captured right here. Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you all that, by oh, the way. Oh, they got him? Yeah, they, they, Paul Revere actually never made it, I think, to, uh, like, Concord. He made it to Lexington, and then he got captured by, like, a British patrol right out of that area. And then it was actually other horsemen that made it to Concord. But the other horsemen, everyone just went out of hell with those people. They're lame. And then everyone just made Paul Revere the guy, although he, even did, he didn't really make it to Concord. It was like a team of riders that went out telling everyone about what was going on. Damn, I could have I could have sworn he made. I didn't know he got captured and of all places right there on Great Road, right outside the airport. Yeah, dude, look at him. <laughs> right outside the airport. He got he got arrested after <laughs> having a uh, having a, a good night out at Applebee's. He got arrested right outside. Man, busted right outside the airfield. Can you believe that? Man, he Hands sat- come AFB. Dude, he sat there and he rode out of Boston up to Lexington. And he came up here because this was where Lexington was. It was just around this green right here. It wasn't the rest of this. And he went, ooh, the British are coming. Get ready. And then he ran right out of the city. And just two miles away, the cops pulled him over and arrested him. He didn't even Man. make it to Concord. Like, the, everyone else made it to Concord. He did not. That's crazy. Sad. Pitiful. <laughs> but, but, hey, he's a legend. Uh, I think, honestly, it's just because he was a silversmith, and that sounds really cool. Because he worked with silver. I think that's the only reason why everyone made him a big deal. Uh, But anyways, with that, we got to get on to the next one. But still, thank you so much for the support and help with this channel to keep on running. I I, I don't really know how we got onto the whole Lexington and Concord thing. But still, thank you for helping this channel to keep on running. And I hope you enjoyed that little rabbit hole. And so with that, we are on to the next one. And up next, big shout out to Carl with the exclamation points. He puts in a five and does not leave a comment. But thank you very much, uh, Carl, for that support. And we also have a five from CK Bold, uh, who says, take a live check question. And thank you, CK, as well, for that support. And we shall grab one. And it's going to go to um, JB, who says, have you ever held a Kimber Micro 9? And uh, Jay, that's one of the few uh, small, like, I think they're called subcompacts or something like that, the pistols. Uh, I have not actually seen that one in person. I've seen some other Kimbers, but not that specific one. Uh, but Enforcer, what say you? Uh, I would have to say that I have uh, not held a 
uh, a Kimber of any kind, for that matter. So sadly, I'd have to declare. You held a 1911 Kimber. No, I, I never held a Kimber. I, I've held I've held 1911s, but I've never held a Kimber 1911. No, I guarantee. You, like I think you just forgot. Like we we uh, the same place you got that Tesla 1911, you held the Kimber 1911. It was like all silver, like chromed out one. Oh yeah. Well, I never shot it. That's that's what I consider as carrying. You know, because like you have to shoot it and get the experience and everything. I have held one. It's it's a 1911, so it's like all others because they're made the exact same way, like the exact same angle grip and everything. Um, but I mean, you know, it was a 1911. Um, you know, I like 1911s. It's just that I don't like mine chromed out. You know, like I like mine to be like the original government issue 1911s that were given out in World War II and World War One. Those are the ones I like. Kimber seems a little bit too Gucci for me. Uh, and for that reason, I'm out. <laughs> but with that, thank you so much for the support. I hope that does address that well. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right. And the next one goes to Dark Warrior 137, who puts in a five. And let's see here. He says, do not read out loud. I've never seen that at the beginning of a Super Chat before, so now I'm very curious and concerned. <laughs> so let's see. He says, oh, I, uh, uh, oh, oh, dear Lord. Uh, I don't know why. I, I, does it look like that? Like, okay, pull up Norway, Sweden, and the Murmansk Peninsula. Let's oh, see this no. on the map. I know what he's about. Yep. Yeah. You, yeah, you will see it when you see it. Well, is this it? Is it? Is it, we're looking at it? Yeah, that's the Murmansk area up here. Oh, and then you look at oh. Norway and Sweden. You know, like in the, the you know. He knows it's pointing toward Russia, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, good point. Um, but you're seeing it now. Uh, yeah, I think I, I <laughs> yeah, I see it. The, this is actually like. How did you come across that dark warrior? <laughs> How did you just stumble across that? Okay, so this is actually a big geography joke. I'm not going to let the live chat in on it, but that's actually a big geography joke. I've known about this for years because, like, it's a meme. It's a, it's a meme. I hadn't included on this meme before. Well, I've known, <laughs> I've known, and now you know. So now every time you look at the Scandinavian countries, you're going to be like, ah, yes, genitals. <laughs> Thank you so much for the support. Dark Warrior, I hope that does address that well. And I knew about it, Matthew didn't know about it, and now you've introduced him. And so with that, uh, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Hoodoo, Texas. Um, and he and puts in a five, by the way, while I'm trying to cope with that voice crack. Um, he says, about 46 K2s have been delivered to Poland, already under the 180 tank contract. And if war breaks out in the Suwalki Gap, uh, they may be front and center. And that's true. Uh, they The Poles actually have a good amount of K2s. And they're actually planning on bringing in some K9 Thunders, which are the, uh, the, or the South Korean SPGs. Uh, they're actually going to build Hyundai Rotom factories in Poland, which I don't know why I forgot it was Hyundai Rotom earlier that made the tanks. But Poland actually has a contract where Hyundai Rotom is going to build factories in Poland, and they're going to start churning out hundreds of K2s and hundreds of K9s to build up the Polish Armed Forces armor and uh, artillery uh, units into a much larger size than they are right now. So that's actually really cool. And uh, those tanks will be front and center if anything happened at the Swalki Gap. And I would like to see how they perform in that kind of situation. I think they perform fairly well given the circumstances. But with that, Thank you so much once again for support. I hope that does address that well. And we are on to the next one. And our next one goes to the Badger Bro, who puts in the five and says, Enforcer, is there a strategic benefit in defeating Orc World slowly versus as soon as possible? Uh, there is no real strategic benefit in defeating them slowly. Um, there is a the, really the biggest strategic benefit in winning a war is winning one decisively and quickly. A lot like we did the Gulf War in 1991. That was massive. Uh, you, like a country's goal is to end a war as fast as possible. That's why at the onset of a war, everyone's always saying that the war will be over by Christmas uh, because they want it to be over by Christmas. It is the best case scenario if it's over in a short amount of time. There is never a good thing for a war to drag out. Um, when wars drag out, it's because it no one can make any lead uh, leadway or progress on ending it, and now it's the waiting game on who can end it the quickest or who's going to give up the quickest. Uh, and so with that, I hope that does address that well, and thank you so much once again for support, Badger Bro, and helping this channel to keep running. And with that, we are on to the next one. And our next one is going to go to a big snack 100 yet again. He uh, puts in a five. It says, Museum of Flight in Seattle, Washington is way better, and we have an SR-71. And, and also, I think, don't we have an SR-71 in Huntsville? We have one here in the city of Birmingham. Oh, we got a couple then. Alabama's got a few of those uh, lovely birds. Man, we do have a couple of them lovely boys. 
Um, but where the hell is this uh, Museum of Flight? Hmm. This has got to be near an airport, I'm assuming. Because they're always near an airport because you have to fly them in. You know, you have to, I mean, you have to fly it in, you know what I mean? <laughs> Hey, that reminds me of our viewer in Alaska. I wonder how he's doing. That's why I tiger. Yeah, I wonder how he's doing. Uh, we haven't seen him for a while. Seattle Museum of Flight. The Museum of Flight, Seattle, Washington. Okay, it's not near. Oh, it is near an airport. It's near the first one that I went to, and I was blind. Let's go see it. All right, all right. Seeing an F-104 up here. A NASA F-104. Pretty cool. What do we have here? Is this the trenches of World War One? It is. It's hell on earth. It's Ukraine. <laughs> but beyond that, um, pretty cool. I like that exhibit. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. They have a 787 already. Oh, yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's near Everett, Matthew. That would make sense, wouldn't it? It would. It would. It would. Um, they got a P-40. They got a, a Lunar Rova. They got the SR-71. They got a DC-3 up there. I like the DC-3, me personally. I think it's kind of cool. They got an Apollo capsule. Everyone's got an Apollo capsule. It comes free with living. Uh, big stud. Big, big stud. stud. <laughs> <laughs> man, imagine being the German that gets your brains blown out by a big stud. <laughs> it's, it's like, man, I would hate to be like that. American than that. Like an honor. <laughs> it's a big stud. <laughs> Get him big. Oh my god, he's real. I wish I could pull up that meme and give you all the context. Oh look, a super constellation. Uh, a B twenty nine. You know, if Lukashenko had a plane, he'd be called Big Fatty. <laughs> a big stud. Get him up here, big stud. <laughs> uh, uh oh, we got a collection of Boeing's here. Oh, rot, 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 Watch rot. out. Oh, uh, is there a seven thirty seven in the mix? No, there is not. Thank God. <laughs> What's that over there in the corner, though? In is the back. Is this a Concorde that this guy's standing on? Look at that wing. That looks a lot like a Concorde wing. Yeah, he's up there with it, too. That's weird. Man, he's up there with it. Oh, they got a B-17. Oh, wow. Those are cool. I've hey, actually been in one. That's the plane right there on the uh, Disney cartoon. You know, when they said, we're going to need 47 more of these planes. And he turned around and said, Mary. That's that plane, man. You know the cartoon I'm talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, <laughs> like, come on, man. I, I don't no, even know. The joke just fell flat. <laughs> come on, man. You don't know your memes? Man, I know a lot well, of Riley's them. daughter. That seems like a bit of an insult Dude, or something. Dude, that's like Chris's mom. <laughs> <laughs> man. I, I wrote, uh, Drew Chris, uh, oh, Riley's daughter is a shark on the front of that plane. <laughs> that's rough. Man, it, it, <laughs> she going, <laughs> Chris's mom be like that. She'd be <laughs> just uh, through dozens of men a day. But anyways, we got a zero <laughs> right here. <laughs> Matthew's like, dang, that's brutal. Oh, look, you can see, dude, they got alcohol in this jet. They just got casks over here just resting. Nice. <laughs> respectable. I don't drink, but respectable. They got a Japanese AWACS? Huh. That's new. Um, Cool, but new. Um, Overall. Oh, they do have a Concorde. Oh, the British Airways one. The one that cracked windows. Oh, yes. British Airways. And there, there it is inside. Mm, brilliant. The windows were so small, though. That plane was really like it was cool because it was futuristic, but like the plane itself was just not really practical. Like the small windows, the noise, uh, the, the fuel wind. usage, and all that stuff. Everything about the thing was terrible, but I respect them for trying to make it work. Like that was respectable, the fact that they even put it into motion. But like, you know, it, it kind of like had it coming when it was retired. Yeah, um, they they that crash was not the reason they retired it. They retired it because the crash was a great excuse to get rid of an uneconomical plane. Um, because this thing never made a profit, funnily enough. Uh, but still, really cool museum. I gotta say, you you've got your point saying that this is a nice museum, and so with that. Thank you so much once again for support and helping this channel to keep on running. And I hope you liked us looking at the Museum of Flight in in Seattle, Washington. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and the next one goes to Aaron Shu, who puts in a $20 donation. Uh, and thank you very much, Aaron, as well, for that very generous support. He said, fun fact, the U.S. Army Tank R&D Center is in Warren, Michigan, and it's called the U.S. Army Tank Automotive and Armaments Command. I like that. It's <laughs> at the Automotive and Armaments Command. Uh, well, let's go to Warren, Michigan, and check this out. All right, so here's Warren. There's the Warren Technical Center, so I'm guessing this is it. Uh-huh, I think this is it, Matthew, because they have the Estes Engineering Center here. 
Estes, like the model people? Yeah, like the model rocket people. Um, huh. Let's see, and they got the GM Design Dome. What's in here? Oh! It's like for real GM. Yeah, Wait this is. Wow. Wow. Oh. wow. I'm liking this. I'm digging it. That's pretty nice. That's pretty. This is in the tank and arm, automotive armaments command, though. Like, uh, oh my goodness, man, that Corvette is sick. Which one? This one? No, that I... one you were just looking at. Uh, uh, this one. Yeah, that one. That one. I like that. Man, I honestly like this one, the Batmobile. That's like the average car turned into a car. Man, this one looks like it's going to be like a like a damn flounder, you know, just going around, along the ground, going. You know what I mean? Like it's like, huh? I don't know about that one. That one's cool. Someone said, "No, you're looking at the GM Tech Center. You're supposed you're looking at you're supposed to be looking for the U.S. Army Tank Automotive and Armaments Command." They say. Sorry, I got distracted. All right, back on our search for the. Uh... <laughs> it's oh, here we go. To it. It's right down here. <laughs> it's right down below. Oh, it's right on the street. Yeah, look, like look. The it's Corvettes like... and the man. That's why the, That's why when you serve in the military, it comes with either a free Charger or a Corvette. My God, we just got the answer. It's because they're right next door. Yeah, Genius. they go right over to the GM Knowledge Center. They get the knowledge, and then they buy it when they retire. No, nah, man, they get the knowledge of how good the Corvette is, and then one officer who served in this place was like, hey, did you know that like, the Corvette's a really cool car? And then it like spread like a plague throughout the Army. <laughs> That's why the Corvette is like <laughs> yeah. the car of officers. Uh, but let's see here. Okay, so we found it. So what, what do we got here? The Department of the Army Police, so I'm guessing that's the military police, uh, because that would make no other sense if it was not the military police. But, wow. Uh, any any reviews of this place? Oh, they do, actually. Let's check it out. I once got my truck fixed here, and it only took three hours, so I think it's a very good business. Commercial trucks uh, use the Mound Road Gate. Oops. Good customer service. You wrote a five-star review to say that, too. That's kind of weird. Army Strong. One star review. One star review. Okay, so no one really had much to say. So let's go to the U.S. Army Tank Automotive Command and check out the reviews up here. They made me really mad. I have excellent credit, and I was all set to buy a brand new M1A1, but they refused to sell oh my me God. one. I would have been able to drive one home, but no, you cannot own a tank. So frustrating. Dude, that's a Russian right there. <laughs> like, the Russians are like, I could not be a tank, bleed. It, it has six like likes. <laughs> it has six likes on it. It's like, they should know that you can only buy those in cash. You can't buy those with credit. Yeah, obviously, you, you, like you got to be a foreign country. But anyways, the burgers were good, not better than the defect burgers. Uh, the fries were hot and fresh, but no seasoning. Three out of five rating, meh. I, it's been a pleasure to be stationed at Detroit Arsenal. I've been wait what? Oh my God! It's a part of Detroit. Run, run, oh. dude! Biggie bags. Man, you gotta outside. make your pilgrimage down to Gary uh, every once in a while, dude. Well, you uh, like hmm, yes? Yeah, so let's drive through hell. Take a left at the Packard plant. <laughs> the rotting Packard plant down here. Uh, you can see it right there. Mm, yes, take a, take a right near the rotting Packard plant right there. And then start driving up the street to the Army, <laughs> to the U.S. Army Tank Automotive Command. Uh, but, dude, look at these pictures. Huh. Oh. It's kind of a rough place. Is it? Is this, oh, this is the Automotive Command. Goodness gracious, man. Those buildings look very government. Uh, let's see here. Any interesting reviews? You know, honestly, this would be a place if we were to make a long-form documentary video, I would like to go here and see what they do at this place. I would too. You know, although it's in Detroit, and we would be risking our lives because Detroit is an active war zone, I would like to see it. Me personally. Like, like I would like to go and check this place out. Uh, but... Anyways, with that, I hope that does address that fairly well. Thank you for sharing that with us, Aaron Chu, because I never even knew that. And that is incredibly cool to check out and see this place. Also, is this really like Estes? Like Estes, the company? They have a nice this office, is... that's for sure. Like, this looks really nice on the inside. This is very modern if it's the Rockets. Yeah, it's the Estes Engineering Center. Huh. But is it really the Rockets? I don't know. Do they have a website? Um, it says GM. Let me take this off screen really quickly, just in case it was a troll website. Let me make sure. Man, these cars could be nasty. They could be, man. You never know. So it doesn't take you to Estes. It just takes you to General Motors. So I don't know. A um, little weird. But anyways, with that, I hope that does address that fairly well. And with that, 
we are on to the next one. Thank you so much once again, Aaron Shu, for really showing us something pretty cool. Yes, indeed. And up next, so we have a $10 super chat from Stephen Waters, who says, what is your evaluation of Navalny's doc, Putin's palace? Um, I thank you so much for the support, Stephen Waters. And I thank you for your first super chat ever. I hate to put you down <laughs> because I'm going to put you down. So I have not read that document, Putin's palace. So sadly, I wouldn't be able to make a comment on it because I'm completely ignorant about the piece that you're talking about. But I do thank you for the support and help this channel to keep running because you are making this channel possible and hopefully I'll be able to try and get around to reading that and maybe I'll have an answer then. But sadly, I'll have to declare ignorance right now because I just wouldn't know. Um, but with that, we are on to the next one. And thank you so much once again for helping this channel to keep on running. And Just Coding Stuff said, can you explain your title, NATO Deploys Troops Statement? Yeah, uh, just rewind because I did it at like, the beginning of the stream. So just rewind to like 13, 14 minutes in and I literally start talking about it. And so with that, we are on to the next one. And up next, a big shout out to Junebug72 who put in a $4 donation and Mike who put in a 2 uh, And thank you both Junebug and Mike for that support and no comments to address, but we do appreciate it very much. And we also had a 5 from Philip Fixes LSA. Uh, and he said, Enforcer has a thing for a well-paved road and cathedrals in military vestiges. And you should have a random generator of your go-to thank you lines. I should. <laughs> that would be pretty good. That'd probably be pretty smart. Uh, but I still thank you for the support and helping this channel to keep on running. And I do like cathedrals and stuff. I think they're pretty cool architecturally and style-wise. I think they look nice. Uh, but still, thank you so much once again for the support and helping this channel to keep running. Because folks like you help to make this channel possible. And if it wasn't for folks like you, we wouldn't be able to help to keep this thing running. And so thank you so much once again. I hope that does address that well. And with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to James Karg, who puts in a two and says, first time here, and I hope this helps. Hey. And James, welcome to the LSA. This is your first time here and your first time supporting the channel. And of course, it does help to keep us running. So every bit of support helps, and we appreciate it very much. And of course, sir, what say you? And every bit does help, and you're doing your part. And I got to thank you for your first time being here and your first time supporting the channel as well. Uh, it helps us to keep this thing running, actually. So I'm, great, I'm greatly appreciative of your support. And thank you so much once again. And so with that, we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to Wyatt Logan, who puts in a two and says, I can't wait for my flag. An excellent stream tonight. And Wyatt, thank you very much. And also, we can't wait to send them out as well. Uh, and we have all of our packaging and everything like that coming in right now. I literally unboxed our packaging earlier today. Um, and also our flags are coming in as well. They're in production, and they will be here soon. Um, so the estimated ship date, like we said on the website, is April 22nd. And we are very hopeful to have them out by that date. Um, but we're very excited to send them, um, by the way. And I'm excited to get Andrew signing. Uh, but, and, and Forster, what say you? I can't wait to start signing. <laughs> it's, it's over that. Thank you so much for the support, Wyatt Logan. I hope that doesn't dress that well, and I cannot wait to get our, uh, the flag to you. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and moving on to our live chat section. That is actually our last uh, last super chat to address. And I just learned I can't multitask. I can't type and also talk at the same time. It doesn't work, so I'm going to stop typing. Um, but anyways, moving on to our live chat questions, we have our Morse code decoders of the stream. Cliff Simonson, Mark Hodges, Earl Bernou, Paul Schultz, Kevin Jay, Stilchin, David Millsaps, and Toxic Bananas. They said, Enforcer, LSA Signal Corps reports tonight's Morse code dispatch is NATO is ready to roll, and they just don't say it all that much, and long live the LSA. And ding, 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 That's the sound of money. And that is the jackpot. Y'all hit it dead on the nail. That was the Morse code message of the night. And I got to congratulate y'all for getting that correct again. It is the 763rd day of the war, and y'all got that right again. And so with that, thank you. Thank you very much for getting that done on the nail. And I cannot wait to see y'all do it again. Oh, <laughs> But still, thank you. So thank you so much. And with that, Matthew, it is time for us to move on into the live chats proper. We're going to try and answer as many of them as we can until 1230 local time, which means we have nine more minutes uh, to be able to answer these live chats because three hours and 30 minutes of stream is a very long time. And so we're going to cut off the live chats around that point. And so with that, we're on to the first one. All right. And our first one is going to go to Seb SK. And he says, if you could have one single military land vehicle, what would it be? And for me, I would have to say it's a tough question because there's a lot of good vehicles out there to pick. Um, honestly, right off the bat, I'd have to say I would like the newest Leopard that they have out there. And I would like that Leopard tank. Um, 
Okay, Man, that's a tough Panther. choice, though. Uh, yeah, the newest one, the newest leopard, the um, the one in, that they sent into Ukraine, I think. Oh, the KF fifty, uh, the KF fifty one Panther, the one in gray. Uh, I'd have to see it to know. Let me Google. Let me Google. Also, tell me what the price tag on that thing is in case I want to flip it. Uh, okay, this one. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take one of those. Uh, how much does it cost? Uh, uh, What's the charge, sir? What's the charge? What are the charges? Eating a meal? A succulent Chinese meal? How dare you, sir? Get your hands off. Get your hands off my... This is the bloke who's talking about. What's the cost... What's the cost of the other, the uh, the model one down below it? That will give us an idea. It's like four million or something like that. Four million. I'll have one. <laughs> I'll have one. <laughs> if if I could answer that question, I would probably pick. Hmm. I'd probably pick a challenge two, because I think they're kind of cool. <laughs> but you know. It, it, it would be tanks. Maddie would get the K51 Panther. I get a challenge too. It'd be a good day. Or I get an M1A2 Abrams because I like the Abrams. They're pretty cool too. Or a Leclerc. Really, just any main battle tank. As long as it was a main battle tank, I'd be happy with it. So any of those, I'd be fine with. I think that'd be pretty cool. Uh, and so with that, I hope that does address that fairly well. And with that, we are on to the next one. All right, and also, uh, Seb SK said fundraiser time. Man, that form, I don't know about all that. Uh, what, what if we had a tank, though? Like, if we could simply, like, let somebody who owns a tank, uh, let us put, like, a decal on the side of it that says the Enforcer in white, like the logo. That would be so sick. Um, Dude, but also, diesel? speaking, oh, yeah, that would, yeah, he's done that, too. Uh, but, like, speaking of which, uh, y'all remember I was talking about the armored vehicles we saw on a video yesterday. It was a goat armored vehicle. We saw them in Ukraine. It was actually the, the rebels were using them, the Russian, free Russian and rebels. Um, that would be a cool sponsor enforcer one day to get if we could ever get them on like a video or something like that. That would be really sick. Like have, the, have like the armored vehicle company sponsoring a video. That would be cool. I was just thinking about that. Man, and I, that would be pretty cool. That would be really neat. That would be sick. Man, that would be sick. You know what would be really sick is if we can get some LSA flags to the Free Russian Army, so that way the flag of the Leaf Spring Army is flying on Russian soil. That would be cool. Maybe if we, uh, maybe if we can get sponsored by the 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 goat company with the trucks and stuff like that, we can have them send over one, like uh, a courtesy of the LSA, and also send the flag in the truck. That would be really cool, wouldn't it? I, man, that'd be cool as hell. That's some lofty goals. We're just like, can you just send one of those $400,000 trucks, please, to Ukraine on our behalf? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, and shipping included. Oh, my Lord, that would be so expensive to put that thing on a ship and have it sent over. Oh, yeah, I would forget about that, man. <laughs> like, banish the thought. Banish the thought. Uh, but with that, I hope we address that well. And we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to uh, Will Callahan, who says, would China cut a deal with the West to stay neutral, but get pieces of Russia as payment after World War III? Oh, uh, I think things would actually go back to status quo um, at, after World War III was over, because if it didn't, it, nukes would probably fly. So it'd probably be a pretty short-lasting war. It'll probably last for maybe a month. Someone's going to get curb stomped, and that someone's going to be Russia. And then in the meantime, the negotiators are going to be going, listen, y'all, let's just end the war because it's going to go badly if we don't. Let's just end it, and let's go back to status quo, okay? And then everyone's going to go, okay, okay, and then that will be the end of it. Because I don't think it'll it will ever progress as far enough to actually get something like that done against the Russians almost in an unconditional surrender because they'll never surrender. They will nuke us first before they surrender. Uh, and so with that, I hope that does address that well, and we are on to the next one. And the next one goes to O-Tubes. He says, I heard online that some guys from the UK are fighting with Russia against Ukraine. And he, have you heard of that? I, I, heard, I saw that question come in earlier in the live chat. It was actually during the 10-minute countdown. And... I, I have to be honest with you, I have not heard about that. I would not know about it, and I have to do some research to see if that claim is true or not. Uh, so, unfortunately, I have to declare ignorance at the moment, but I'm kind of leaning towards that's possible um, because it's not out of there. I mean, they are individuals, after all. They can do whatever they want, and maybe there are some deranged British people out there, kind of like there are some deranged Americans out there who think the Russians are in the right and end up supporting them. Uh, and so with that, I hope that does address that well, and we are on to the second-to-last question of the night. And this one goes to Epic Trains Canada, who says, How ready are Finland and Sweden to assist the Baltics? And is the Air Force ready? And do they have land forces that they can send using landing ships? 
Um, can you reread that one again real quick? They said, how ready are Finland and Sweden to assist the Baltics? Is the Air Force ready? Do they have the land forces that they can send using landing ships? Uh, I do not think that they have the landing ships appropriate. I do not think that the they would be able to withstand the Russian Navy for the short duration to be able to transport uh, troops into the Baltics. I do not think they'd have the ability to support the Baltics uh, properly if that was to happen, if the uh, if the Sawalki Gap was closed. So I would have to say probably not so. That would probably be fairly difficult to do. Uh, also, sorry that I was distracted there, everyone, uh, because I saw someone come in with a very strong political statement. And I just got to say, we dissuade political statements of all kinds, for the love of God. We've been saying that for 763 days. Why do some people never get the memo? I, like, I'm not trying to be rude or anything, but why? Why? Like, like I, I try and keep politics out of this. And then people come in here and act like it's a political pedestal. Like, I know people sometimes do that just because, but, like, I don't know. It, I don't know why, y'all. It just kind of irks me every once in a while. Because I'm like, why do people do this? Like, why do I have to deal with it? Uh, but anyways, with that, we are on to the final question of the night. And so... Who is the lucky last person to throw in the lucky last question of the night? And that viewer is Griffin Provenzano. Hey. He says, if the Sawalki Gap did kick off World War III, who do you think would have the advantage with what is deployed there right now? Uh, probably, um, if, we, if our numbers are correct in Belarus and Kaliningrad, it probably would actually be the Russians that have the upper hand for a short while. They might actually be able to advance uh, far enough to be able to close off the Sobolki Gap, but I have a feeling it would most likely be temporary because armored pushes would be coming from Poland and Lithuania on the Sobolki Gap to break through and open it up. And on top of that, the highways in these areas, the two of them that head from Lithuania into Poland, both go north to south. So that offensive would greatly favor a NATO uh, counterattack instead of the Russians holding the area. It would be much more difficult for the Russians to hold the Sawalki Gap than it would be for NATO to retake it. With the terrain in the area, the uh, difficulties posed for supply, and not only that, the kind of defensive positions that the Russians might be able to set up. It probably wouldn't end well for them. But that is a temporary kind of an advantage. And it really is only an advantage because it's such a small area to cover. They might be able to advance that 40-mile distance and close the gap from two sides, but they wouldn't really be able to do that anywhere else. The Baltics would be hell on earth for them to fight in, even if it was uh, cut off from supplies and cut off from additional reinforcements. They probably would have to take a long time to fight over that. And then the war on the actual mainland of Europe would be a complete failure for the Russians from day one. So... Uh, with that, I hope that does address that well, at least in my opinion, on a general overview. Um, but with, uh, let's see, and also Warfire said, haven't they lost at least half their tanks? Yes, and that's why I'm thinking that they'd really only be able to get an advantage during the first opening days, maybe the first two or three days, because it would be an element of surprise kind of a deal going with it. Uh, which always gives you an upper hand advantage. Even if you are worse off than your opponent, uh, element of surprise will give you an advantage for a short term. Uh, but it won't take long for NATO to... Uh, to reorganize, uh, regroup, and then attack the Sawalki Gap and break through and open it back up and probably start pushing the Russian uh, armed forces towards the city of Kaliningrad or maybe even cutting Kaliningrad off entirely in some kind of a preemptive attack. Uh, but with that, I hope that does address that well, and we have reached the end of tonight's stream at exactly 3 hours and 30 minutes long. Um, it's been an absolute honor getting to share this news with all of y'all tonight. I cannot tell y'all that enough. At the peak tonight, 11.2 thousand of y'all were here. 84,000 people have watched this stream since it started to when it ended. Um, no other stream does this good on the platform on a daily basis that covers the Ukraine war. Uh, and we are entirely honored to be the ones that are able to have all of y'all here with us each and every day and to be able to share this news with y'all. It means a lot to us, and we are greatly appreciative of every single one of y'all choosing this channel to be your source of news and coming here pretty much daily to watch it. I cannot tell y'all how much that means to us. I said a little bit about it earlier, but this really is a dream come true for me to be able to do something like this on a day-to-day -day basis. And I cannot tell y'all enough uh, how thankful we are for all of y'all to be here with us every day and join us as we continue to cover this news and do what we love to do. Uh, y'all make our passion possible through y'all's viewership, through y'all's subscribership, through y'all hitting the like button, and through y'all supporting the channel with Super Chats. Everything makes this channel possible. And I got to thank y'all greatly so much once again for being here with us tonight. And if you're new to this channel, you've never been here with us before, please consider subscribing. We are up to 180,490 subscribers at this very moment, and we are continuing to climb uh, day by day. Matthew freaked me out there. I thought something bad happened. I thought, <laughs> uh, but 
we are continuing to climb day by day. The Lee Spring Army, which is the community of the Enforcer Channel, continues to grow stronger and stronger with each passing day. And not only that, it continues to do incredible things, supporting Ukraine and also getting the news out there. And so thank you all so much once again for watching. Good night, good luck, stay safe, take care, Slavo Ukraini, and long live the Lee Spring Army. The Lee Spring Army will never die. And good night, folks. Thank you all for another great stream. And 84,000 people have viewed this stream already. So it's going to be a very big one indeed. And thank you all, all once again for making it a great one. And of course, Slava Ukraine. Here I'm Slava. And we'll see you all tomorrow. And good night. Yes. The leaf, ring, army, sense, it's regardless.